back at Phoenix International Raceway, ESPN Speed World, and here now is the starting lineup for today's Checker 500, the first time ever for the Winston Cup cars here at Phoenix. Pole sitter is Jeff Bodine at 123.203 miles an hour, his third pole position of the year. Outside of row number one, it's Rusty Wallace in the Kodiak Pontiac car number 27. The second row is Harry Gand in car number 33 and Ricky Rudd in number 26. Row number three, the number 89 car driven by Jim Sauter and then Bill Elliott in number nine. The fourth row, Mark Martin in car number six along with Neil Bonnet in 75. In row number five, it is Sterling Marlin in car number 44 and Rick Wilson in number four. Then Michael Waltrip and Lake Speed in the uh, sixth row. And as we take a look at the rest of the starting lineup, you will notice that interspersed through uh, the starting lineup are a few of those that compete regularly in the Winston West series. They have also joined their Winston Cup counterparts in this event this afternoon. And Bob, this is a very unique racetrack. There are two other one mile tracks on the Winston Cup circuit. Both are very high bank racetracks. These turns are relatively flat and the dog leg on the back. It's a D-shaped racetrack and certainly one that'll give them plenty of challenge here this afternoon. There are a total of 43 starters in this race with Bill Schmidt in car number 03 bringing up the tail. As you can see, the cars are now going down the front stretch on their last warm-up lap. Next time around, we'll be getting the green flag and the start of the Checker 500. The Phoenix International Raceway is a one-mile oval. The pole time was 29.220 seconds at a speed of 123.203. We'll go 312 laps, and we should have about 90 to 95 laps before the cars will have to come in for a fuel stop. It is a 500 kilometer race, not a 500 mile race, so 312 laps. And our in-car camera will be carried by Dale Jarrett, the Hardy's race cam. Cars now are down the back stretch. This is not a true oval. There is instead a dog leg in the middle of the back stretch, creating sort of a D-shaped oval. They are now through turn number three as the pace car is leading the field at this time. But we're just about to go green and start this Checker 500. Look at the hill over there just outside of turn number four. There usually are a few hundred people on that hill watching a race. Today there are thousands there and the grandstands are packed. We are set to go for an afternoon of exciting racing in Phoenix, Arizona. Here comes Jeff Bodine and the others down for a start. Rusty Wallace on the outside of the front row. The green flag waves and here we go. Well, Rusty Wallace would certainly like to lead this first lap if at all possible. That would give him five bonus points in Winston Cup competition, but Jeff Bodine has taken the lead now. Right now going out of turn number two, it is Jeff Bodine that leads Rusty Wallace and Ricky Rudd through the dog leg. Now they go high on the racetrack and dive into turn number three. Now Wallace begins to move in on Jeff Bodine. Would like very much to lead lap number one. He'll try to go inside of Bodine. Coming up four, Bodine a little bit sideways. Side by side action here. It's going to be Bodine leading Ricky Rudd goes to the inside of Rusty Wallace and tries to get, capture second position but cannot do it. And Ned, in the opening lap, we've seen some uh, bumping and banging going well, on hey, out there. It looked like almost a repeat of North Wilkesboro a few weeks ago as they got together there banging around. And I expect we'll see a good bit of that here this afternoon. Well, as you indicated, Rusty wants to lead so to make sure that he gets those five extra points. Uh, he needs all that he can in order to win that Winston Cup. He is second in points going into this race. Rusty Wallace right on the back bumper of Jeff Bodine. Now Rusty will look inside as the cars come out of turn number two once again and go down the back stretch. Side by side racing. It's Wallace to the inside in car number 27. And Jeff Bodine, the pole center, outside in number five. And Rusty is going to take the lead from Bodine, at least momentarily. Here comes Bodine back, however, on the outside. But look at the number 26 car driven by Ricky Rudd. It's also involved in the contest. And Bill Elliott is not too far behind in car number nine. So Rusty Wallace does have the those five bonus points, he gets credit for leading lap number three. Well, unless Bill Elliott leads a lap, that now cuts the margin to 74. He went into the race with the 75 point, 79 point deficit, now down to 74. Rusty Wallace, Jeff Bodine, Ricky Rudd, and Bill Elliott are your first four. Running back in fifth position is Harry Gant, and those five are right together on the racetrack. We have a car slowing down on the racetrack. That's Davey Allison, the number 28 Haviland Ford. He is very slow through corners number three and four. And he's going to uh, stay out there on the racetrack, but something has obviously happened to that car that caused it to slow. So Davey Allison 
has a problem and he has dropped back to the almost the tail of the field now trying to struggle with that car. Meanwhile, we go back up front and see what uh, is going on up there. Rusty Wallace still has the lead. Bodine comes out of the fourth corner very high. Ricky Rudd is still running in third position. Bill Elliott is fourth. Fifth is Harry Gant. Back in sixth position is Jim Sauter. In seventh is Neil Bonnet. Eighth is Mark Martin. Ninth is Mike Alexander. And in tenth position is Sterling Marlin with five laps out of 312 completed. You can see that the first five cars have separated themselves a little bit from the rest of the field as back in sixth spot is Sauter. Off the fourth corner once again, it is Rusty Wallace leading in the number 27. Kodiak Pontiac and the Chevrolet number five driven by Jeff Bodine hanging in there in second. There are the first five once again. We welcome you, those of you who have been watching tennis, we are at Phoenix International Raceway. The Checker 500 Winston Cup race from Phoenix International Raceway. We are here on a beautiful Sunday afternoon. Phoenix International Raceway hosting the Winston Cup Series for the first time ever. The race has just begun. We are seven laps into it. And at the moment, it is Rusty Wallace who has the lead over the pole sitter of this race, who is Jeff Bodine. He is running in second. Third position belongs to Ricky Rudd. It's a 312 lap race, 500 kilometers on this one mile track. And we'll be back with more of our coverage in just a moment as we go back now to tennis. Contest for second position is between Jeff Bodine in car number five and Ricky Rudd in number 26. And let's go down to the pit area and get a report from Dr. Jerry Punch on what the problem might be with Davey Allison's car. He slowed dramatically just the last few laps. We're with team manager Robert Yates and Robert Davey been slowing. What's the problem with the car? Well, uh, for a minute there, uh, failed to hook up both tires, you know, like he thought he'd broken the axle. Evidently, the springs in the ratchet uh, failed to work, and uh, you know they had him uh, just spinning one wheel there for a little bit. It seemed to be all right now. Uh, goes. Possibly a rear end problem or early ratchet problem trouble for Davy Allison. So Davy Allison is going to be struggling to get back up toward the front of the field. There he goes inside of the number 75 car driven by Roy Smith from Seattle, Washington, who has already clinched the Winston West Championship for 1988. And that's Dave Marcus in car number 71, just ahead of Davy Allison. So Allison struggling here in the early going. Look at the interval that Rusty Wallace has opened up over second place Jeff Bodine. And Jeff has his hands full now with Ricky Rudd in car number 26 as Rudd challenges for second spot. Well, Bob, a couple of drivers who had never been here before, Rusty Wallace and Ricky Rudd, have adapted very quickly to this relatively flat one-mile track at Phoenix. Jeff Bodine, of course, came out here last week and did some testing, and they, he said that helped him to sit on the pole, but right now he does have his hands full with Ricky Rudd. Let's watch Rudd's tactic here as they go through the dogleg on the backstretch. Not making a challenge for that second position at the moment, but it is a very tight contest for the runner-up position as Rusty Wallace has the lead. Now we'll watch Rudd stick his nose to the inside of Jeff Bodine as the cars come down the straightaway. Of course, Rudd driving the Buick and uh, Jeff Bodine in the Chevrolet as the Pontiac of Rusty Wallace has about a 12 or 15 car length lead at this moment. Well, Rudd took advantage of a little bit of a slip of Jeff Bodine. Bodine went a little bit high. That's all Rudd needed to stick the nose of his Buick down on the inside, and he's going to take over second position. So now Ricky Rudd has second spot, dropping our pole sitter Jeff Bodine back to third position. Still running in fourth position is the Bill Elliott car, and Harry Gant is in fifth. We'll be back with more of our live coverage of the Checker 500 from Phoenix International Raceway. Welcome everyone to Phoenix International Raceway. ESPN Speed World today is live for the Checker 500 Winston Cup race. And here are the top uh, positions now with 18 out of 312 laps completed. It's Rusty Wallace in the lead. Ricky Rudd is second, third is Jeff Bodine, fourth is Bill Elliott, and fifth is Harry Gant. 
Sixth position belongs to Mark Martin, then Jim Sauter, Neil Bonnet, Sterling Marlin, and Lake Speed. We are under our first caution period of the afternoon. It was caused when Brett Bodine blew an engine and did some, dump some uh, fluid on the racetrack, so they have been cleaning it up. Brett Bodine is out of the race. Uh, to summarize what's happened so far, the number five car of Jeff Bodine led the first two laps, then Rusty Wallace passed and has been leading since that time. Everyone is still on the lead lap with the exception of Brad Knopfsinger, who pitted too early when the yellow flag came out. So here comes now the field off of corner number four. You can see the tremendous crowd that has turned out for this first ever Winston Cup race at PIR. On lap number 19, the green flag comes back out. We are racing once again, and the field comes down the front straightaway, jockeying four positions. And these turns are relatively flat, Bob. It really gives the drivers a challenge as they go into the turn. There's a dog leg on the back stretch as we see Rusty Wallace maneuver through that part of the racetrack. Ricky Rudd, now that he's moved into second, wants to put a challenge on Rusty. We have seen throughout the first uh, 16, 17 laps of this race, the first five sort of uh, separating themselves from the rest of the field as Harry Gant running back there in fifth position is able to stay up with the four ahead of him. Now, Dale Earnhardt is uh, trying to move up through the field. He started this race back in the 13th position and now tries to gain a position over the number 75 car of Neil Bonnet. Let's get out of the pit area and Jerry Punch. Well, Bob, that documents some of the drivers who've had trouble early on here at the Checker 500. We mentioned Brett Bodine has already retired the Crisco Ford with an engine problem. That first caution flag, a lot of oil came out beneath the Budmore Ford, and they have taken that car back to the garage area. Also having trouble, the young Davey Allison has had to have one Ford on pit road. They think they may have a ratchet problem in the rear end of the car. Both wheels in the rear of that car are not pulling. And the third driver to have problems, but it really was a break for him, was Alan Kowicki. He had a flat right front tire. The tire went flat. This is the yellow flag came out. He came down pit road and changed it, and it's back at the rear of the field. All right, we're watching the first two now, Rusty Wallace in car number 27 and Ricky Rudd in number 26. And that's something that we will discuss here in the early going, the tire situation. Then. Now, there were five, actually six cars that began this race on Hoosier tires, everybody else on Goodyear. The Hoosier drivers were Ken Schrader, Roy Smith, Johnny Rutherford, Greg Sachs, Trevor Boys, and Ken Bouchard. But now, bear in mind, we're racing in the desert, and that is sand there on the inside of the track. And when you kick up a little bit on that on the track net, I would think that perhaps we might see some tire problems as the race goes along. Could very well. In fact, these tires don't have a great deal of rubber on them. A lot of the drivers were concerned about, about the amount of rubber they have on them. Of course, the lesser amount of rubber you have, the less heat buildup you have. But if you run over something, it's much easier to cut. And if the wind should get up and blow some of that desert dust out there, that could do it. Here we got a spin down in turn one. Car sideways in turn number one. Another car spins behind, so two are involved in this. We'll try to get the numbers for you just as quickly as possible. One car is to the inside of the track, and the other one is uh, in the middle of the racetrack. I believe that both of them are going to uh, be able to keep going. Derry Cope is one of them involved in the number 68 car. And Jimmy Means, I believe, was the other one that uh, got sideways and spun to the inside of the racetrack. Bar both are under their own power right now. The second caution period of the afternoon is upon us as the uh, race to the uh, caution is on. And uh, Bill Elliott is in the pits. Let's go there. It's a four-tire change for Elliott, Bob. He's, he's come in. He's about the only one here on pit road, although many of the crews are ready to service their teams. Elliott's the lone one of the front runners that's chosen this opportunity to come in. Uh, they've already got the right side change, left side change. He's gone. He'll pick up the back of the pack. And, boy, being in the back of the pack on a track like this that's difficult to pass on really gives him a lot of work to do. Here's a replay of what happened that has caused our second caution of the day. That's Derry Cope, who is spinning there in the middle of the racetrack. Derek's car had been a little bit loose. He spins to the outside of the track, and you can see the oncoming traffic. Michael Waltrip in the yellow car, number 30, gets down on the inside, and then... Jimmy Means. Jimmy Means in car number 52 comes in and spins around. Both drivers have brought their cars back around since then. So with on lap number 24, we are under caution for the second time this afternoon. We're in the desert southwest of Phoenix, Arizona for the Checker 500.
Every seat is filled and they're standing wherever they can at Phoenix International Raceway as they enjoy for the first time ever Winston Cup racing at Phoenix International Raceway. Here are the top five with 25 laps completed. Rusty Wallace leads in car number 27. Ricky Rudd is second in number 26. The number five car of Jeff Bodine is third. Harry Gant in number 33 is fourth. And Mark Martin in car number six is in fifth position. Bill Elliott has made a pit stop. He is at the back of the pack. So he has a lot of cars to pass to get back up there in contention. We're watching from uh, Dale Jarrett's Hardy's Oldsmobile and the Hardy's race cam. And he's back near the end of the pack too, Bob, because he and Sterling Marlin, who is just in front of him in the blue car number 44, had just made pit stops as well. And you can see Bill Elliott's car not too far up in front of him as they get ready for a restart. There you can see Dale getting set, uh, he has his hands on the shifter, getting set to move up through the gears as they come off of corner number four and to begin the acceleration. That will put us back to race speed. Pace car is in, here comes Rusty Wallace, the leader off corner number four, single file formation as the green flag waves once again. Some passing going on back in the uh, fifth position as Dale Earnhardt tries to move up. And I believe he successfully got away that fifth position from Mark Martin. So it is now Dale Earnhardt who is fifth. There are the first three, though. It's Wallace, followed by Ricky Rudd and Jeff Bodine. Well, Dale Earnhardt has done a good job in the early going here, Bob. He started in the 13th position and is now moved up, has now moved up to the fourth position. So he's on the move to the front. Indeed, he has. He has passed Harry Gant now, who has been running in uh, fourth or fifth position since the drop of the green flag. But now Harry is back to fifth as Dale Earnhardt in car number three. The good red Chevrolet has moved into fourth position. And so, as we indicated, he still has a mathematical chance of winning the Winston Cup, but it's going to take a near miracle for him to pull it off. Nevertheless, he'll not give up until it is absolutely over with, and he would also like to get five bonus points by leading a uh, lap uh, here this afternoon, so he'll be trying to move up through the field rather quickly. And of course, as always, he'll be trying to win the race. That's his first consideration. He says the points will fall where they will if you win the races. Let's go to Dr. Jerry Punch in the pit area, who's watching Rusty Wallace lead this race. Well, gentlemen, we saw Bill Elliott come in and make a pit stop and a four-tire change during that most recent caution flag. We did not see Rusty Wallace, Jeff Bodine, or Ricky Rudd come in. And I've checked with all three crew chiefs, and they say they just can't afford to gamble this early. This track has a history of taking innocent victims out, getting mired back in that traffic, back in the field. It's just too much of a risk. They were even surprised that Elliott would pin. And now Bill Elliott is back in that traffic, trying to pick his way, tiptoeing up through the pack, and Elliott's red work cut out for him. Well, indeed, Elliott does have a lot of cars to pass before he gets back up front. There you can see a whole group of cars as they race down the backstretch. Uh, Darrell Waltrip is involved in this group. So is Neil Bonnet leading uh, the way here. The number 83 car belongs to Lake Speed. The 25 car red car on the outside is Ken Schrader. Then comes Terry Labonte and the 17 car of Darrell Waltrip. What we're watching is 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th. Terry Labonte trying to move on the inside of the Ken Schrader car number 25. Now Schrader is one of those drivers who started on the Hoosier tires and he has worked up through the pack so those tires might be working well for him. Well Ken Schrader uh, did start this race from 24th position so he has moved up very nicely here in the uh, first 31 laps of this race. There's Neil Bonnet who does have uh, a history of racing here at uh, Phoenix International. He is an 18 time winner in Winston Cup competition. He has uh, been in Winston West action here at PIR five times and compiled a very impressive list of accomplishments. A one time winner in 79, and then a couple of pole positions, 77 and 81, and earned three runner up positions and a fourth place ride in Winston West competition here at this racetrack. A lot of cars they're running together that are very evenly matched. You can see how close they are running together. You can see Kyle Petty coming into the picture at the top of the screen there trying to move around Phil Parsons. So there's good racing all over the racetrack as they expect you to do here at Phoenix. Schrader in the number 25 car running the high line through the first and second corners. We go back up front now and check on Rusty Wallace. He still has the lead by about five or six car lengths over Ricky Rudd, but Rudd is right there poised in a position to move into the lead if Wallace should make a slight bobble. We'll be right back. The leader, Rusty Wallace, Ricky Rudd second, then Jeff Bodine, Dale Earnhardt, and Harry Gann. In sixth spot is Mark Martin, then Jim Sauter, Neil Bonnet, Lake Speed, and Ken Schrader. 
11 through 15, Terry Labonte, Darrell Waltrip, Kyle Petty, Phil Parsons, and Bobby Hillen Jr. So there are the first two. It is Wallace leading Ricky Rudd, and those two have uh, pulled away from everybody else just a little bit. So it's basically a two car race, but look at this racing that's going on. Ken Schrader, Darrell Waltrip, also the uh, number 21 car of Kyle Petty is involved in this race, as is the 11 car of, uh, of Terry Labonte as they're racing here for the 11th position. That's Waltrip in car number 17 with the inside line on Ken Schrader, but Kyle Petty is also right there in car number 21. Bobby Hillen Jr. trails in number eight. Waltrip trying to take the spot away from Ken Schrader out of turn number four, and Darrell has it. Now, Kyle Petty has come from 25th position, Bob, so his car is really working well. And we'll say again that this is not one of the easiest tracks on the circuit to pass on, but the Wood Brothers have that Sitco Ford working very well for him as he's up there battling for close to a top 10 position. With a couple of the Rick Hendrick cars, the 17 of Darrell Waltrip and the 25 of Ken Schrader, both uh, from the Rick Hendrick stable, and then the 21 Wood Brothers car driven by Kyle Petty. He sneaks his nose to the inside of Ken Schrader in turn number four. Let's see if Petty can successfully complete the pass. Alan Kowicki and uh, Bobby Hillen Jr. in cars seven and eight respectively watching all this from just behind. Schrader taking that high line on the racetrack. We've seen him in that groove since the drop of the green flag. And now Kyle Petty has about a half a car length advantage on Schrader, but through the dog leg, Schrader battles back and holds on to that spot. Well, the car number seven of Alan Kowicki, he made a pit stop earlier and has come back up through the pack to battle with that crowd. So his car is really running good. The number 55 of Phil Parsons is the fifth car here in the line. Now we see Alan Kowicki moving to the inside of Ken Schrader and Kowicki. Trouble here on the front straightaway, car number 24. The number 24 car driven by Gary Collins from Bakersfield, California has crashed here on the main straightaway. The car to the inside just and, uh, near the start finish line. And we have uh, both Rusty Wallace and Ricky Rudd making their pit stops. So while Collins car is sitting on the inside of the pit wall. Here is Rusty Wallace and Jerry Punch will call the stop. Well, the Kodiak crew gonna work on Rusty Wallace's car, right side. Car on the jack, they had the right side tires already off and replaced. They will whip around to the left side of the car. Barry Dotson brings that left side jack around. Jimmy Maycar in the front tire. John Dotson the rear tire. Norman Kosamisu puts gas in the car. They are trying to get out and beat Ricky Rudd off of pit road. Left side tires are on. Rudd's car still on the jack. And Rusty Wallace, a great pit stop. And now Rudd's car off again and heads back down pit road. He just barely beats Ricky Rudd out of pit road. And he also beats uh, Dale Earnhardt out. Well, I'll tell you, the pit stops here are so important. Track position will mean everything because of the fact that it is tough to pass on. So they want to get in and out as quickly as they can. That means that many less cars that they'll have to pass once they're on the racetrack. And Dale Earnhardt obviously thinks that he should have gotten out ahead of Rusty Wallace. So there's a bit of a uh, discussion about that on the track. We'll get it all sorted out for you there before we go back to green. The yellow flag is for a crash involving Gary Collins here on the main straightaway. We'll be back with more of our live coverage after this. Bob Jenkins, Ned Jarrett, Jerry Punch, and Dick Bergren back at Phoenix International Raceway for the Checker 500 Winston Cup race. And we are under our third caution period of the day with lap 45 completed. And here now the top five. Alan Kowicki is the leader in car seven. Sterling Marlin in 44 is second. Then Bill Elliott in number nine. Dave Marcus in 71. And Joe Rutman in number 73. The uh, yellow was for a crash involving the number 24 of car of Gary Collins. He is okay. NASCAR considering the use of what amounts to an oxygen mask. Jerry Punch explains in this quick fact. Quick facts are brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil. The big Q stands for quality, always has, always will. With the ever-increasing emphasis on aerodynamics in motorsports, more air is going around the car and less is getting inside. So a lot of drivers, particularly the older drivers, are more concerned about breathing the hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide within the cockpit. That's why Richard Petty has tried this prototype device. It's an aviator's mask out of an F-14 attached to his helmet. Now this hose goes to a fan in the floorboard of the car attached to the roll cage that pulls air in from in the cockpit and runs it through this chemical filter. This filters out the carbon monoxide. Recently, carbon monoxide levels have been shown to be almost in the toxic range, but after this apparatus was tried by Richard, it's almost zero. 
NASCAR is taking a good long hard look at this setup for possible safety enhancement next year. So NASCAR looking for anything they can to make racing safer in the Winston Cup Series. Let's go down to Dick Bergren, who has a report on Dale Earnhardt. Dick? Well, Earnhardt had a bit of a problem here leaving the pits. What happened is at the end of pit road, there's a paddle man, a guy that's got a little paddle, and on one side of the paddle is a green go, and on the other side of the paddle, there's a red stop. Well, Earnhardt's at the absolute tail end of this pit area. I should say the absolute front end of the pit area, and the paddle man was outside his car. He was to the right of the automobile, and he had the stop sign up. How Earnhardt ever saw that stop paddle, I don't know, but he was sure the first guy to leave the pits. The thing was stopped. He stopped on the inside. Wallace stopped on the outside, and then right behind Wallace, uh, Ricky Rudd stopped and then all of a sudden the paddle turned around and went green but it was at that point academic and Earnhardt's guys really thought that since they'd beaten to the paddle they ought to be able to have the chance to start in the front but that's not the way it happened. Jerry? Well, well, Alan Kowicki made another unscheduled stop here in the pits. Dickie just moving down pit road very slowly. He will be stopped by that man you're talking about with a big stop sign there. A little bit of confusion here. They were concerned about possibly having another tire go down. And they brought it in and checked the car, and the tires were not flat. And Paul Andrews, the crew chief, said, hey, we'll just put some wedge in the car. It must be just awfully loose, and it must feel like it's going flat coming out of the corners. Another unscheduled stop in trouble for Alan Kowicki. You'll notice the cars re-enter the racetrack through an acceleration lane. There is some grass. Yes, that's real grass believe it or not, growing in the desert, the acceleration lane just to the inside of the actual racetrack, and so they must use that to get back on the racetrack, and that adjoins the racetrack uh, in turn number two. Now, Bob, they held him there until all of the cars had gone by. That's why Alan Kowicki was held there. It was not a penalty or anything of that nature. All the cars are still in the lead lap as we get the green flag, excepting Eddie Beerswall in car number 23 and Brad Knopfsinger in car number 98. Beerswall was in the pits for quite a while behind the wall. He has rejoined the race, though, as the race resumes on lap number 48. It is Sterling Marlin in front with Bill Elliott running second. As we have a car spinning, that is, I believe, it's uh, Dale Earnhardt, is it not? Down the back stretch, kicking up a tremendous amount of dust. That's Joe Rutman, I believe, in car number 73 that's also involved, but there is a second car that's spun, and I believe it is indeed Dale Earnhardt. Yes, it is. The yellow comes out once again for the fourth time, but Earnhardt is stopped back there on the back stretch. Joe Rutman is getting his car going again and pulling back onto the racetrack, but not the Dale Earnhardt car. It is sitting helplessly on the inside of the racetrack at the dogleg. Well, it doesn't. I don't know if the car won't fire or maybe something happened to it that caused the spin originally, but certainly Earnhardt is not moving and he's going a lap down right now as the leaders go by. Well, let's look at it once again to see if we can determine what happened. Okay, here's Earnhardt at the right of your screen trying to move on the inside of Rutman. It looked like Rutman might maybe have tried to pull down and uh, maybe give Earnhardt room on the outside, but Earnhardt had already made the commitment to the inside and they got together and went spinning in the desert dust. So a definite setback for Dale Earnhardt, who came into this race 198 points behind. And this is certainly going to set back his chances of winning that Winston Cup. Well, it certainly will. In fact, it'll just almost negate any chances that he has of winning it. And the car just simply wouldn't crank, Bob, after he got it, uh, after he spun down there. Joe Rutman did get his car fired. Now there is a record back there pushing Earnhardt's car back to the pits. He's already gone a couple of laps down. So, boy, this is tough. He has his car fired now, so he will be coming back to the pits. Earnhardt had to gain 50 points on Bill Elliott to keep from being mathematically eliminated for Atlanta. So, indeed, it could be the end for Dale Earnhardt and his chances at a Winston Cup. Back in a moment. Back at the Checker 500, Sterling Marlin leads. Bill Elliott is second, followed by Dave Marcus, Rusty Wallace, and Ricky Rudd. In sixth place is Ken Bouchard, then Jeff Bodine, Harry Gant, Terry Labonte, and Jimmy Means is 10th with 52 laps completed. We are under our fourth caution of the day because of an incident on the, the backstretch, Ned. Dale Earnhardt trying to make a pass on Joe Rutman. That's Earnhardt in the dark car down on the inside. Rutman in the car number 73, and they tangle, spin down to the inside of the racetrack into the dust. Earnhardt's car would not refire. I think I said that he had gone two laps down. He's made several pit stops. He's coming back into the pits right now, but he only lost one lap. The record did get to him, get him pushed off, got the car started. He's in the pits right now, and Dick Bergeron is there. Well, early 
earlier this year, we've seen teams align the front end of the car using a piece of string. This is a new method. Kirk Shelmerdine is doing it using a pair of eyes, and that's it. He eyeballed the front end. They jacked it up. He changed the toe in, just guessed is where it ought to be, and they're letting it back down again, and Earnhardt's back out again. Up pit road, Jerry Punch has more. Jerry? Well, Alan Kowicki continues to have his problems as Erex Ford back in again. A 33-year-old Wisconsin driver has been on pit road for a four-tire change. Now, he just came in before the, the green came back out. They checked the tires. As the green came out and Earnhardt spun, Kowicki also had another right front tire go down. He came back in. They put four tires on the car. He has been back in the pits three more times under this yellow flag as they try to decipher what the problem is on that car number seven. So a couple of uh, major contenders have made numerous pit stops here in the early going. We're still under caution. However, the signal is being given for one more lap and then we will go back to green. Now, Ned, there was some discussion about the cars being restarted in single file formation, which is a departure from what NASCAR usually does, and that is the two abreast formation. But they have decided to go with the two abreast. They will continue with the concept that they have used for the last several years, and that is any car that is one or more laps down can go up and pull up beside of the lead car. So we'll see Earnhardt making a move now that they've been given the signal for one more lap. He'll be pulling up beside of Sterling Marlin. And let me say, Bob, that there's only one car out of the race at this point, and that is Brett Bodine, who blew an engine early in the race. Gary Collins crashed in car number 24, but they've made repairs on his car and have gotten him back in the race. And Alan Kulwicki, as uh, Jerry Punch indicated, is having his problems. He is in once again, getting ready to go back out, however, another time. There's the car number 24 in the pits. He had been out for a while after a crash here on the front straightaway, but they're trying to get him back out there. Dave Marcus also made a pit stop. He goes back out on the racetrack. So Gary Collins' car is the only one along pit road. He had contact with the wall coming out of turn number four, hit the inside uh, retaining wall, did not damage the car apparently too badly. As a matter of fact, as we speak and as the cars come off of corner number four to get a restart, Gary Collins will go back into the race. Now there Earnhardt could not get all the way up to the front before the green flag came out, so he's back behind about 10 or 12 cars, so he doesn't have a very good chance of getting his lap back right now. He's got a lot of cars to pass before he can do it. Here's the green, and Marlin leads him through corners number one and two with Bill Elliott running second and Rusty Wallace in third spot. Fourth is uh, Ricky Rudd, and in fifth is Jeff Bodine. We'll watch Dale Earnhardt move up through the traffic, going to the outside of the number 10 car driven by Ken Bouchard. Now we'll challenge the 11 car driven by Terry Labonte. And it's a situation where R Rusty Wallace now makes a bid on the second spot from Bill Elliott. They go into turn number one side by side. It's Wallace in the number 27 car on the inside, and Bill Elliott in the red and white number nine Coors Motorcraft Ford on the outside, and still nobody. Everybody has a real lock on that position as it's a side by side and door handle to door handle race. Now Wallace edges ahead just a little bit and takes over second. Here comes Rudd in number 26. And Bill Elliott's car kicking out a little bit in the turns, moving a little high. That gives them the opportunity to move on the inside. Now Elliott had hoped to pass Sterling Marlin. He was running in second place at the restart of the race so he could get five bonus points, but instead he's moving back in the field and Marlin is moving away. He is already back to fourth and is uh, being challenged for that spot by Jeff Bodine in car number five. So Elliott has fallen from second back to fourth. Now make that fifth position as Bodine sweeps O'Hara in the uh, dog leg. Bill Elliott's car obviously not working the way he wants it to but now he battles back a little bit on the outside however Jeff Bodine still has that fourth position nailed down a lot of battling going on all over the racetrack there's everybody fighting for position and Earnhardt in particular trying to move his way up towards the front of the pack so that he could get a lap back as Herschel McGriff makes an unscheduled pit stop on pit road car 04 Herschel the oldest driver in the field, but certainly one of the most competitive. And here's Rusty Wallace going for the lead. Rusty Wallace will go inside the 44 car driven by Sterling Marlin. They come off of corner number four, and I believe Rusty's going to get the lead back, although it's a drag race down the straightaway into turn number one. Let's see what happens. It's going to be Earnhardt. I mean, uh, Rusty Wallace going back into the lead. Uh, Marlin battling back on the outside in car number 44. However, he does not want to relinquish that top spot. 
great competition going on here and also Ricky Rudd at number 26 watches all this now Wallace is going to pull ahead coming out of corner number four Marlin will go to second Rudd is on the inside in 26 and Jeff Bodine is not too far behind in the yellow and white number five car well the inside is definitely the per preferred position right now in the condition the racetrack is in they've been running there most of the week most of them qualified right down on the inside and that is the fastest groove but Marlin doing a good job on the outside there's Rudd moving to the inside in the dogleg, taking over second spot. Here comes Jeff Bodine pulling alongside Sterling Marlin now, trying to take over third. Some close competition at the stripe. It is Marlin with just a slight advantage, but now Jeff Bodine inches ahead going into turn number one, and Jeff Bodine will go into third spot, but watch Marlin on the outside. As he comes off of turn two, his car is very strong as they go through the dogleg part of the racetrack on the back stretch, but then he has to back off going into turn three, and Bodine does get the position. And here comes Bill Elliott, meanwhile, in car number nine, and there is Earnhardt also in number three, but remember, he is one lap down to the field, having been involved in a spin on the back stretch with Joe Rutman. Rusty Wallace on a tremendous roll here in the Winston Cup Series, and we asked him earlier, can you keep your streak alive? I hope so. The, the car has really been extremely fast. We've got laps down in some of the races because cut tires, running over debris or things like that, but uh, uh, this is the car that I've won three races with this year. This is Whitney, and uh, it's been good to me. Uh, we, I think we got the momentum going for us right now. Whenever you can come out to a new track and be awful fast without even never testing on it, and, and knowing that that's the car you've won with three times previously, you've got a good feeling going into the race, and yes, I think we can keep it up. Well, Rusty certainly is keeping it up. He's keeping up that tremendous pace that we have seen in the past few races. He is leading the Checker 500, but by just a few car lengths over Ricky Rudd. Back after this at Phoenix. Caution waves over Phoenix International Raceway for the fifth time this afternoon as Jimmy Bound in car number one apparently blew an engine. There was a tremendous amount of smoke. That's caused a pit stop by Bill Elliott. Let's go there. Bob, the reason for the pit stop is the last time Elliott pitted was on lap 25. Now everybody else pitted on lap 47. Elliott is now pitting out of sequence. The reason for this, lap 25, while there was a yellow flag on the racetrack, Elliott suffered a flat right front tire. Maybe this computer virus is sort of catching on with right front tires. We're sure seeing an awful lot of them go down here this afternoon. All right, Elliott, though, has uh, completed the work in the pit area and rejoins the racetrack and the rest of the field. See if anybody else comes in for a stop, I would... Uh, well, I would kind of doubt it right now, wouldn't you? I Ed? sort of doubt it. Uh, most of them have stopped within the last 20 laps, and they don't want to lose that track position. There is apparently some uh, oil on the racetrack, so our yellow will be a little rather lengthy one as they clean up the oil on the racetrack dumped by Jimmy Bound. We'll be right back. Once again, Dale Earnhardt has come in for a stop. Dick Bergman is there. They really did not have a chance to properly set this car up when Earnhardt spun in the backstretch and crashed with Joe Rudman. So they're going to take an opportunity now to put four fresh tires on it. He's had a chance to go fast with it. Apparently, Kirk Shelmerdine's got a pretty good pair of eyes because they've got the front end pretty well aligned, even though they didn't use any of the fancy tools. Right side of this car is well damaged, but Earnhardt is going like a rocket. Now there's the red paddle again for him. He's got to wait until the field passes, and then they'll let him go by. Uh, the whole field is going by Earnhardt at this point. He's going to be sitting there for a while because we got cars just now coming out of corner number four as they are still under caution. Look at this crowd. There is also a uh, Cardinals football game on the other side of town, but if they draw more people than this race has, I will be surprised. There is just an incredible number of people that have gathered for this first ever Winston Cup race. Let's check the top ten. It's Rusty Wallace leading with Ricky Rudd second, then Bodine, Marlin, and Labonte. Our second five, Gant, Martin, Lake Speed, Kyle Petty, and Mike Alexander. That's with 67 out of 312 laps completed. We have had uh, five different leaders and uh, five different lead changes. And this is our fifth caution period of the day. And this, again, was because of a blown motor on the number one car driven by Jimmy Bound, one of the Winston West competitors. He was just about to get the black flag, we had noticed, from Harold Kender, who was just about to wave it to him when the big puff of smoke went up and the Bound car expired. 
and he put a lot of uh, oil down on the front straightaway. Now, we mentioned a moment ago, Bob, that Dale Earnhardt did not get back up to the front runners on the restart. Now, he has the prerogative to do that, but they were told in the driver's meeting that whatever position you're in, if you're trying to get back up, if you're a lap down, you see that white spot? That's a line across the racetrack going into turn three, and wherever you're at, when you come by there, coming around to get the green flag, that's where you have to stay. So Earnhardt just simply had not gotten up any further than that. There were about 10 cars that he needed still to pass before he got to that white line. You can see the oil dry being placed down on the racetrack on the front stretch here and uh, apparently a quite a large amount of liquid was put down on the track that has necessitated the uh, track crew to come out and clean up the situation. So we are still remaining under our caution period and so we'll take another commercial break and be right back for more of the Checker 500. We are back at Phoenix International Raceway in the Checker 500, a 500 kilometer race, 312 laps, and we are 69 laps into this race. A rather large number of cautions already. There is some uh, historical data on Phoenix International Raceway. The first event was held here in 1964. It was a 100 mile championship car race, and the winner was A.J. Foyt. This area has a long tradition of racing, and as a matter of fact, so does this racetrack. It's just that the Winston Cup Series has never competed here before until today. They've been running Indy cars here for numerous years, and of course, they hold what's called the uh, Copper Classic every year, which involves midgets and sprint cars and uh, super modifieds and championship dirt cars and stock cars, but uh, and also some Winston West races have been run here, but not a full-fledged Winston Cup race. We get the signal now, Bob, for one more lap before the green flag will be displayed again, and we'll see how far Earnhardt gets up through the pack this time. He is one lap down. Here he comes. Ken Schrader has been struggling there in car number 25. Dick Bergen can explain why, perhaps. Well, I can tell you, Bob, that Ken Schrader has struggled before at this racetrack and won anyway. For example, in the fall of 1987, he drove a championship dirt car, which is about the most fearsome kind of race car you can imagine, on this speedway. Partway into the race, the right rear shock absorber fell off the car. That didn't bother him at all. He went on and won. A few races earlier, Schrader had run an automobile here, a midget with a V6 engine and a 200 cubic inch motor. That's sort of like putting a car engine in a motorcycle. And he won with that thing. That car was so extraordinary. Extraordinary. They banned the entire concept, the concept of the wedge midget, the V6 engine in it, the whole thing. So Schrader knows his way around here, and he can handle a car that's not exactly right on this speedway. For more, Jerry Punch. Jerry? Well, Dick, a lot of the crews are concerned here about overheating in the pits and not overheating the crew members, although it's a little warm here, but on the track. Now, on a lot of banked asphalt tracks, when rubber comes off the tires, it'll roll down off the banking, but here on a flat track, rubber stays on the racetrack. Jimmy Means, Eureka Vacuum Pontiac, getting a lot of rubber in the grill in the front of the car. He is overheating, as are some of the other cars. We'll keep an eye on that. Right now, the biggest commodity here in the pits is who has a hose to wash these cars off when they come in. We're going back to green. And indeed, Dale Earnhardt has positioned himself now right beside Rusty Wallace as the green flag comes out. And so Earnhardt is trying to get his lap back. There is a tremendous friendship and camaraderie between Dale Earnhardt and Rusty Wallace. And perhaps, uh, well, I was going to say Rusty may let Dale get his lap back completely. But no, here comes Rusty battling back beside Dale Earnhardt and showing him no corner whatsoever. Wallace wants to keep Earnhardt back a lap. Look at this battle out of four. Oh, they touch. They bang together. Of course, it's a good friendly tap that he gave him there, but also hopefully he could get him a little bit out of position, but he didn't get him too much out of position. Here comes Earnhardt back on the outside. I didn't think the cars would look like they would after North Wilkesboro, but I believe they're going to after this race. A lot of bumping and banging and paint trading going on, and now Ricky Rudd challenges for the lead as Wallace got a little bit high on the racetrack and out of the groove, and that was all that Ricky Rudd wanted and Jeff Bodine to take the lead away. So here comes Rudd as the leader now in 26. Wallace is second in 27, and then the number Number five of Bodine third. Well, R Ricky Rudd has been knocking on the door at the lead uh, several times here this afternoon in the first hundred miles. That was the opportunity he needed when Rusty Wallace got a little bit sideways and turned one. He stuck the nose of that 
Quaker State Buick up there and took the lead and now beginning to pull away a little bit, Bob. Rusty Wallace had led 55 of the first 72 laps, now relinquishes the lead. And of course, Rusty is also concerned about leading the most laps because that too will gain him some extra Winston Cup points in his uh, bid to take away the lead from Bill Elliott. Well, Bill Elliott, as a result of making a pit stop, is way back in the pack. He must be back at least uh, 30th position. Johnny Rutherford making an unscheduled pit stop. Johnny making uh, an infrequent start here on the Western Cup circuit. That was a stop and go situation for him. He didn't stay in too long, so Johnny Rutherford back out in the go again. Car coming down the straightaway. The first in line is Dale Earnhardt, but he is now back on the lead lap. Here's some racing going on in the mid uh, sections of the pack. The number 17 car of Darrell Waltrip is there. Richard Petty also in this line of cars. Bill Parsons in car number 55. Harry Gant in number 33. That group of cars have really been battling for the last 20 or 25 laps, even before the caution came out. Here you see Richard Petty putting a little nudge on Phil Parsons in car number 55, but couldn't make the pass that time. Richard Petty, by the way, has competed in seven of the eight Winston West races that we uh, have had here at Phoenix from 1977 through 84. Okay, claims a career 200 wins, was a Winston West winner here at Phoenix three times in 78. 80 and 81. So when you talk about stock car winners on this track, Richard Petty tops the list. Now Daryl Waltrip in 17 and the 55 at Phil Parsons. Meanwhile, we go back up front and see that Ricky Rudd still has the lead over Rusty Wallace. Our caution summary, we have had five periods and they have been four. A blown engine on the number 15 car on lap number 14. A spin involving the 68 car of Derry Cope. On lap number 44, we had a crash involving Gary Collins. He's back in the race, however. Then on lap 49, Dale Earnhardt and Joe Rutman got together over on the backstretch, and the most recent caution period was brought about by Jimmy Bounds, blown engine, lap number 65. And Joe Rutman is the latest retiree from this race. He has taken the Helen Race special into the garage area. Let's go to uh, the pit area and get a report from Dr. Jerry Punch. Well, if you take a look at the left side of Rusty Wallace's Kodiak Pontiac, you'll notice there are marks all the way down the left side of that car. Now, the crew radioed Rusty, said, hey, where would those come from, big guy? He said, well, my good buddy Earnhardt, when he came by me a few laps ago, or actually earlier in the race, Earnhardt rubbed him a little bit, said, we're just doing a little bit of racing out here, having a big time. I tell you, points championship up for grabs, over a half a million dollars up for grabs. There's no limp-wristed racing going on here at Phoenix, fellas. They're having a big time. Having a big time at speeds of over 140 miles an hour, I might add. They're there is Wallace as he's dropped back just a little bit now in second position to uh, Ricky Rudd as he approaches now and will go to the inside and pass the 31 slender U car which is being driven here today by Johnny Rutherford and when you talk about experience on the Phoenix International Raceway Rutherford certainly has that category locked up of course competing many times here in IndyCar competition. And Ricky Rudd is moving up close on Dale Earnhardt now about to try to put him that lap back down that Earnhardt got back a moment ago when he moved around the leader. And there is the view from the Hardy's race cam inside the Oldsmobile driven by Dale Jarrett who is in 18th position. That's Davey Allison in front of him in the Haldeline Ford Thunderbird and right behind Dale Jarrett as you hear him decelerate going into turn three right behind him is Bill Elliott. Elliott had made a pit stop put on new tires so he's coming back up through the pack. One laps have been completed in this 312 lap 500 kilometer race at Phoenix International Raceway. We'll be back with more of our live coverage after these messages. There you see the race for the lead between the 26 car of Rudd and the 27 car of Rusty Wallace. And Rudd is trying to put Dale Earnhardt in car number three a lap down. Dale did get his lap back and is at the tail end of the lead lap. And Rudd there in car number 26, the leader of the race, is trying to put him down a lap once again. Let's take a, a look at the top 15 as we have them at the moment. It is Rudd leading with Wallace second, then Jeff Bodine, Sterling Marlin, and Terry Labonte. Second five, Mike Alexander in a good race, Lake Speed, Mark Martin, Kyle Petty, and Harry Gant. 
And then we have Phil Parsons, Daryl Waltrip, Bobby Hillen Jr., Richard Petty, and Benny Parsons running in 15th position. Let's go to the pit area and get a report from Dick Bergeron. Bob, it takes an interesting chassis engine combination to run well here at Phoenix, although none of the drivers re remark that this racetrack looks like Martinsville. You need a Martinsville engine to run well. You need an engine that can produce an awful lot of torque because when they go in the corners, they really drop down in RPM as low as mid-5,000 range. And when they get to the end of the straightaway, in practice, I saw some tacks that were well over 8,000 RPM. And like Pocono, there is no two turns alike on this racetrack. So if you set up to run one very well, you're going to miss it in the other. Most competitors say they've got a torquey engine, one with a lot of power to come out of the corner, and the corner they want to come out best is corner number four. They've given up one and two in exchange for four. Jerry? Well, as you're watching the battle there, Ricky Rudd on the inside of Dale Earnhardt. Remember what happened at Wilkesboro a few weeks ago? Well, that's the exact same two cars. Exactly. That is the Rudd short track car, the Quaker State car for Kenny Bernstein that he and Earnhardt came together with at Wilkesboro. And it's the same car that Earnhardt used last year to win six of eight short track events. And the same car he won with at Bristol here on ESPN. So those two veterans doing battle here at Phoenix in their short track cars. But Gentlemen, now Rudd has put Earnhardt a lap down, but it looked like Dale was pushing him, bumping him there in the rear end, as uh, now Earnhardt has indeed gone a lap down again, but is just trying valiantly to get to keep on the lead lap. Well, boy, he needed a caution there before Rudd got around him, and his crew had to be praying for a caution at that time, but Rudd is just a little bit stronger and was able to move around him. If, of course, the Winston Cup championship is not decided today, and chances are that it won't be, we will have for you the race that will decide the Winston Cup championship, the final event of the year. That'll be at Atlanta International Raceway in two weeks' time. So even if, it, if it's here, if not, we'll certainly have it for you live here on ESPN in two weeks at Atlanta as the 1988 Winston Cup season ends. We're still watching the 26 car Ricky Rudd lead and now Wallace is trying to go to the inside and also pass Dale Earnhardt. Now Wallace moves down to the inside as Earnhardt moves up and gives him some running room. Earnhardt now that he has gone the lap down he's not going to give him too much trouble. He's not going to you know just roll over and play dead but he won't give him too much trouble and hold him back. Wallace now has passed Dale Earnhardt and begins to move away a little bit. Here comes Rudd out of corner number four and completes lap number 93. Still back in third position is Jeff Bodine. Sterling Martin is fourth and Terry Labonte is in fifth position. Bill Elliott, meanwhile, is way back in 18th position. So things have not gone well for Bill Elliott in the first almost third of this race. Those out of sequence pit stops that he made has caused him to be way back at the back end of the pack several times here today. But he has uh, driven very methodically and come back up through the pack. There was one car that was smoking back towards the back of the pack, but apparently no problem with it. There's the interval between first and third, 4.8 seconds. The interval between Ricky Rudd in number 26 and Jeff Bodine in car number five. We'll do it again to see if uh, if Bodine is closing in. The number two car there, right ahead of the leader, Ricky Rudd, is driven by Ernie Irvin. Check it again. Here comes uh, Rudd crossing the line. Here comes Bodine in the yellow and white car number five in third. And it's a 5.4 second advantage now. So Ricky Rudd has things in hand at the moment, pulling away from at least the third place car, although his interval between himself and uh, Rusty Wallace has certainly not uh, expanded by any means as Wallace is still right there and he goes to the outside of Ern Ernie Irvin there in turn number three and disposes of him rather easily. Ricky Rudd from Chesapeake, Virginia is leading the Checker 500 here at Phoenix International Raceway and we'll be back with more right after this. The Estrella Mountain Chain just uh, beyond the backstretch here at Phoenix International Raceway and uh, ESPN keeps you up to date on all the motorsports activity with two programs at 12.30 a.m. Eastern Time on Thursday, Motor Week Illustrated, and then Speed Week at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time on Thursday evening.
Well, toward the end of the race, we're going to be announcing the Goodyear Eagle Driver of the Race Award. Goodyear will be giving $1,000 to the Winston Cup Racing Wives Association in that driver's name. Now let's check the uh, standings as we are now at the 100 lap mark out of 312, almost a third of the way through this race. The lead continues to be held by Ricky Rudd, car number 26. Second position is uh, Rusty Wallace. Third is Jeff Bodine. Fourth is Terry Labonte. And fifth is Sterling Marlin. Let's go down to the pit area. Oh, Rick Reynolds, he's crew chief for Ricky Red. Now, early in the race, you said he was just kind of cruising, taking it easy. How about when he got beside Dale Earnhardt? How hard was he pressing the button then? Oh, I'm sure he was running a little bit harder, you know, trying to keep Dale a lap down because obviously we give Dale his lap back. That's somebody else we got to contend with later on in the race. Now the biggest thing we've got to be concerned with is working that traffic. You know, we need a need a caution here directly. We need a pit stop, need some tires on it. Other than that, he says everything's okay. What will you do in the caution? What will you change? We'll change four tires. That's the story from Ricky Rudge Pit. Jerry Rudge, Punch, what's going on where you are? Well, pretty good battle on the racetrack right now between Sterling Marlin and Mike Alexander, the 44 and the 12 car. But here in the Kodiak pit and the Rusty Wallace pit, they're a little bit concerned. They needed to lead the most laps here today to get those five extra bonus points. They are not leading, obviously. Let's find out what the problem may be. But Barry Dotson, the crew chief. Barry, you wanted to lead the most laps, but apparently it's not working out. What's the problem? A little bit loose right now. We stayed out to get track position. We don't want to take a chance anything happening. We'd just rather run comfortable and, and try to get the lead back later. They're not going to overextend the car. They're going to ride comfortably, and maybe when they get a pit stop or a caution, as Larry McGrail said, they'll come in and get fresh rubber and then try to lead. Gentlemen? Well, Jerry, they're on their longest green flag run of the afternoon right now, and as Larry McReynolds pointed out, they'd like to see a caution here before too long so they can come in and get four new tires on the car. That we're beginning to see some cars slip around a little bit on the racetrack as a result of the tires getting heated up and worn out. But Rusty Wallace's car is still sticking down on the inside as we see him coming off of turn four here right now. But Ricky Rudd has opened up a couple of seconds interval between himself and Rusty Wallace as Ricky Rudd is the leader of this Checker 500. The number 44 and the number 12 car battling for position. We showed you that just a few minutes ago, and here it is again. That's for fifth spot. And oh, Marlin, Sterling Marlin in car number 44 drifted a little high there coming out of turn number two, and Mike Alexander just whooshed by and took over that fifth position. He sure did. It doesn't take much of a slip till the car behind you can move around, and right there was a perfect example of it. Mike Alexander, who in a Southwest Tour race here yesterday, sat on pole position, but uh, did not have very good fortune during the uh, running of that race. Jim Thurkettle was the winner of that Southwest Tour race here at Phoenix uh, yesterday that we will uh, have on a tape delayed basis later this week here on ESPN. And Roman Kalsinski clinched the Southwest Tour championship during that event. Other battles going on on the racetrack involved this group of cars. Alan Kowicki is there along with Phil Parsons in number 55. And Mark Martin is in car number six trailing this trio. And that's seventh, eighth, and ninth. Now Kowicki has come from the back of the pack because he did during that last caution period made a couple of pit stops. So he has fought his way up through the field and, and has done a good job of it, Bob. Again, I don't think that we can say too much how difficult it is to pass on this racetrack and as I say that Alan Kowicki almost makes it look easy but the car really has to work well down on the inside of the racetrack to make a pass. Alan Kowicki looking to the inside of the Skull Oldsmobile driven by Phil Parsons and now as far as Parsons uh, drives high on the racetrack the car slipping just a little bit Alan Kowicki is to the inside as they go down the back stretch into the dog leg right there and still Alan Kowicki now he's going to try to take it away and can't do it completely and now he does as Phil Parsons has to get off the gas. The groove is beginning to move up a little bit particularly in turns three and four. We're seeing some cars that are running a little bit higher there as Sterling Marlin laps past the Eddie Beers wall car number 23. Eddie has been behind the wall a while so he's several laps down. There is Alan Kowicki now who has successfully passed Phil Parsons. Also in the picture there is the number two car driven by Ernie Irvin. And he's one of the top rookie contenders this year on the NASCAR Winston Cup circuit. Came into this race only six points behind Ken 
Bouchard, who is leading the rookie standings, as we see Jimmy Means coming into the pits in car number 52. That's the red car as the other cars go by on the outside. Now that car just ahead of the number seven of Alan Kowicki is Herschel McGriff, who is, shall we say, a veteran of uh, stock car racing along the West Coast. He was one of the uh, uh, original members of the uh, Southern 500, dove in the first Southern 500 back in 1950 and is still an active race driver today. We'll be back right after this. Back at Phoenix International Raceway, the Checker 500 Winston Cup race, we're watching third, fourth, and fifth. The number five car of Jeff Bodine slides high on the racetrack in turn number two, but tries to keep that third position. Fourth is the number 11 car driven by Terry Labonte, and fifth is the number 12 car driven by Mike Alexander. Now, Mike Alexander, of course, driving the Bobby Allison car that Allison piloted for the first portion of this year before being injured at Pocono. And we're very glad to see that Bobby is among the spectators here at Phoenix this afternoon and looking very well. In the pits now is Greg Sachs. Most of the cars pitted at about lap 44 during one of the caution periods so they'll be coming in at about 130 we're on the 116th lap right now most of them will be coming in around 130 to 135 laps the car number 26 of Ricky Rudd just put Neil Bonnie the lap down Neil was running in 25th position so there are still 24 cars on the lead lap after 116 miles. Mike Alexander just doing a fine job of driving that Miller High Life car number 12 car as he moved around Terry Labonte and went into fourth position and now he challenges Jeff Bodine for third. One of the best runs in a long time for Mike Alexander and he takes over that third position as they go into the dog leg but nope here's Jeff Bodine battling back on the outside but a good race here for third position Bodine number five Alexander in 12 and Labonte in number 11 side by side racing through corner number four watch Alexander on the inside now as they come down the straightaway oh they were dead even at the line Alexander the experience he got here yesterday in the Southwest Tour division certainly has helped him but he likes this kind of a racetrack he's a good race driver on a relatively slick flat racetrack and that's what we have here Mike has spent many years driving the uh, half miles and the mile racetracks, the shorter circuits, and does have quite a bit of experience on this type of racetrack. And now he has taken over third position from Jeff Bodine. Terry Labonte in car number 11, now about to move on the inside of Jeff Bodine as Bodine goes high, gives him a little running room, and Terry Labonte takes advantage of it. We have seen Jeff Bodine go high on the track there in the first and second corners for the last several laps, but he's able to uh, get back everything that he loses in the backstretch. Now here's Labonte inching ahead just a little bit out of corner number four. Labonte looking to take over position number four. And it's a side by side race once again into corner number one. But Labonte now is about a half a car length ahead and he's going to pass. And Sterling Marlin is in the pits and Jerry Punch is there. Now this 31 year old driver from Columbia, Tennessee last pitted on lap 26. That's 94 laps to go. So they are getting excellent fuel mileage. They will change the right side tires and they are really putting some weight in the rear of that car to try to tighten it up a little bit. Sterling was so loose he was slipping and sliding. You saw Mike Alexander go by him a little bit ago in the car number 12. Fuel in the car. Great pit stop for the Piedmont crew down the way for Sterling Marlin. But he goes a lap down, Jerry. In fact, he's about a lap and a half behind the leader, Ricky Rudd. Rudd can go a little while before he has to come in because Sterling Marlin, as you mentioned, had run about 94 laps. Rudd should be able to go another 15 or so laps. So Sterling Marlin goes back out onto the racetrack. By the way, that car will sp uh, carry sp the Sunoco sponsorship during the 1989 season. We go back and uh, look at this fourth and fifth place battle between the number 11 of Terry Labonte and the five car of Jeff Bodine at the moment though Labonte has that uh, position nailed down fairly well here's a leader meanwhile Ricky Rudd as he tries to put a lap on the number four Kodak film Oldsmobile driven by Rick Wilson that's lap number 122 that has been completed and Rudd with uh, an advantage now of a couple of seconds over Rusty Wallace. And he might be coming in before too long. Rick Wilson in the Kodak Film Osmobile was running in the 22nd position. That means there are 21 cars remaining in the lead lap. 
That is with over a third of this race completed. So we have seen some uh, drivers staying on the lead lap. And uh, now here is Rudd slowing down out of turn number four and coming in for the pit stop. And Rusty Wallace is falling right down pit road as well. So it's a pit stop with two of the leaders. Let's go to Dick Bergeron. The key here will be whether Rudd and Wallace can do this pit stop without losing a lap. The teams are already over the wall. That's not what we usually see in Winston Cup competition. But the wall here is 30 inches high at this end of the pit. The other end of the pit is only 13 inches high. So they were very ready for Ricky Rudd. Right side tires over. Rusty Wallace already out of his pit. He's gone. He will beat Ricky Rudd and he will take the lead. Well, he won't take the lead, but at least he beats him back out of the pits. Mike Alexander has taken over the lead in the Miller car number 12. And here he comes out of corner number four. Now one thing this has done, it has put Dale Earnhardt back in the lead lap. Those front two cars had passed Earnhardt, but Mike Alexander has not. So that does put Dale Earnhardt back in the lead lap should he get a caution. And there is the leader, at least for the moment, the number 12 Miller High Life, joint driven by Mike Alexander going to the inside of the 03 car driven by Bill Schmidt from Redding, California, one of the Winston West competitors. Harry Gant is in for a pit stop in the Skull Chevy, car number 33. He started well up front in this race and has been in the top uh, 15 most of the afternoon. Here comes the leader down the uh, straightaway once again, completing another lap. And looks like a little bit of a puff of smoke there from one of those two cars. I was unable to see exactly which one, but perhaps just a little bit of tire smoke evident from uh, one of those two cars. In Mike Alexander, the leader. In turns one and two, they do burn a little bit of tires coming off of there, Bob, and we'll see some tire smoke occasionally as the cars come off of that turn. Now Mike Alexander is choosing not to come in for another pit stop, so he stays out and maintains his lead. Now you can see Terry Labonte. There's a car between he and Mike Alexander. Labonte and the Budweiser Chevrolet number 11. See, going down on the inside of the car that Mike Alexander lapped not long ago, so that's how close the first, second, and third is. And there's Sterling Marlin also there, car 44, and Alan Kowicki in number seven. They're having a little bit of a difficult time getting around that Bill Schmidt machine. The uh, Schmidt Racing Chevrolet. Now Labonte moves to the inside of it, the 03 car. And here's Sterling Marlin right behind Terry Labonte. And now Marlin will try to create a third lane, but thinks better of it as they go back into a uh, two abreast situation going into turn number one. Now Sterling Marlin would like to get up there and get back in the lead lap. Remember, he has already made a pit stop with new tires. Look how that car sticks down on the inside. Boy, it just he just drives it in there. That's what new tires will do for you. Now he's got to pass Mike Alexander, though, before he can get back in the lead lap. Here's Alan Kowicki coming up on the inside of Terry Labonte. Benny Parson just made a pit stop. Others will be making pit stops before too long. We understand that maybe there's some smoke coming from Richard Petty's car as Jeff Bodine comes down pit road in the car number five. He was running in the fourth position. Dr. Jerry Punch has a report uh, on this pit stop by Jeff Bodine. Well, Waddell Wilson and the rest of the Levi Garrett crew changing right side tires. Looks to be a routine green flag stop for the pole center, Jeff Bodine. Bodine running in the top five all afternoon. They will scamper around and check the left side tires. They have filled it with a great pit stop, 14.8 seconds. He is down and away. Mike Alexander has come in for a stop also as we watch Jeff Bodine pull out. And Dick Bergeron is there to call the pit stop of who was the leader. And that was Mike Alexander. He is almost certain to lose the lead. About everybody that's done one of these two tire changes here has gone down a lap. Alexander's doing the same things everybody else is. Nice side tires. He's off the jack. He's gone. Good fast stop for Mike Alexander. Very good stop by the uh, crew. And Mike Alexander goes back out onto the racetrack. That's going to put in the lead, we believe, the number seven car driven by Alan Kowicki. So Alan has struggled in the... Uh, first 75 laps or so and got off pit sequence but now finds himself in the lead and he has a while to go before he needs a pit stop because he did stop during the last caution period and that was at about uh, lap 71 when the green flag came back out so he has only run about 60 laps so he should be able to go another 25 or 30 laps before he would be scheduled for a pit stop there's the 33 car of Harry Gant right behind Alan Kowicki in car number seven so with the uh, pit stops some pit stops being made at lap 130. The lead is held by Alan Kowicki, and we'll be back with more of the Checker 500 in just a moment.
We hope you're enjoying today's coverage of the Checker 500 from Phoenix International Raceway, being brought to you by Union Oil. NASCAR drivers count on Unical gasolines. Go with the spirit of 76. 135 laps completed. And the lead held by the number seven car, driven by Alan Kowicki. He is off sequence, though, with everybody else. And for more on that, let's go to Jerry Punch. Well, we mentioned Alan had some trouble early on. Alan had some trouble early on here and had to make a couple extra pit stops. He came in for gas on lap 66. That is actually 22 laps later than did Ricky Rudd, Jeff Bodine, or Rusty Wallace. So he can go another six or seven laps if he needs to. And they are planning on making a pit stop in the next five to seven laps. So he is able to stay out front a little longer. And if he can get a yellow flag, he can make this stop under yellow. They're hoping for one, but they're ready to bring him in in about five laps. Richard Petty being black flag, we are told from here in the pits, a smoking car number 43, STP Pontiac. Ned, we had been noticing that car smoking rather uh, badly, and now it is uh, in because of a black flag. The number 11 car of Terry Labonte is in for a pit stop. Dick Bergman. He is in. He is out already. The gas man fell over and poured a pile of gasoline here in the pits. Everybody is okay, but there's about two gallons of gas laying on Terry Labonte's pit. He's gone with two tires in a very fast pit stop. Labonte was in second position, and there you can see the gasoline spill. That was created by that pit stop. Quite a bit of it laying there in uh, Terry Labonte's pit uh, stall. I doubt if they got that car full of fuel. They made such a quick tire change that I doubt if they got it full of fuel, but uh, that won't worry them too much. They'll figure a caution will come out before they run out of gas, or either they'll need tires before they'll run out of gas. Well, we're looking for a pit stop by Alan Kowicki. He's coming in right now. Seven. And yes, in. indeed, the leader is coming in, and uh, Alan Kowicki makes his stop. Jerry Punch will tell us what occurs during this pit stop. They actually were waiting for him to come in on about three more laps, but he readied in and said, I'm coming in now. Apparently, the fuel pressure gauge began to fluctuate. You can't let that happen on a flat racetrack. You'll end up coasting back to the pit. So he is on pit road getting right side tires, and they are putting a little wedge in the left rear of the car as Paul Andrews, the Z-Rex crew chief here, works on the car. They clean that rubber off the front of the car. 14.7 seconds. Pretty good pit stop for the young crew. So now... The lead will be going to Rusty Wallace in car 27. With everyone having made pit stops now, it is Rusty Wallace that goes back into the lead. There is Rusty, who is in turn number two. Look at that three abreast racing there in front of him as cars try to get sorted out. Uh, Ken Schrader there in 25, 79 car. The red wind driven by Roy Smith. And of course, Johnny Rutherford there in car number 31. And then right in the middle of all this is the leader, Rusty Wallace. Wallace will be first, and Ricky Rudd now goes to second once again. Bill Elliott third, Mike Alexander fourth, and Dale Earnhardt is in fifth position. So Earnhardt did indeed get back that lap, and he now finds himself in a very good position as we have a car smoking down in turn number one, and that's Neil Bonnet in car number 75. We see some smoke coming from that car, and it may be all over for Neil Bonnet. It also may necessitate a yellow. I don't know whether he laid down any oil or water on the racetrack, but the NASCAR know. officials will be looking at that situation closely. There's no indication right now that we will have a yellow. Neil Bonnet is going very slowly, however, in turn three. Well, he could be out of gas. I don't know, Bob, what the situation is with him. Richard Petty is uh, back out on the racetrack still smoking. And Bill Elliott in the pits. I was about to mention that he's due for a pit stop. Earnhardt will be due for one before too long. And here is Elliott getting a right side tire change. NASCAR officials are watching turn number four to see if Neil Bonnet is able to make it around to the pits, and indeed he does, so there will be no caution flag. Bill Elliott's pit stop will be under green. They have completed the tire change on the right side. They have the car filled up with fuel, and away he goes back in competition. Now, we mentioned that Richard Petty is also back in the race, although that car is smoking rather badly. And he is not back in the race. He is in the pit area once again. So, obviously, there's something major wrong with the 43 car of Richard Petty as we watch uh, him come into the pit area right now ahead, uh, pitting ahead of uh, Neil Bonnet. Well, he was in for a while. They had the hood up on the car. There was a lot of smoke coming from it. They thought they maybe had found what the problem is, but you can see now he's going to swing out, take it behind pit wall. They'll continue to work on it. He's fighting desperately to stay in the top 20 in the Western Cup point standings. 
Yes. Neil Bonnet is still in the pit stop, uh, in the pits as well. They're pushing his car off. I think he ran out of gas. I really think the car number 75 ran out of gas, coasted around, and now they can't get the car fired as they push it down pit road. Finally, it does take hold, but Neil Bonnet has lost a lot of time with this pit stop. I think that that uh, smoke or whatever I saw down in turn number one was just the fact that he was down on the inside of the racetrack and kicking up a little bit of dust. I think it was the quick drive that had been put down from a blown engine that was down on the inside of the track, and he pulled out of the line of traffic and got his wheels down in that as we see the leader Rusty Wallace moving around the car number two one of the rookie drivers Ernie Irvin. So Rusty Wallace in number 27 is the leader once again and he is trying to lead the majority of laps this afternoon. That will give him five additional bonus points in Winston Cup competition. And there's an important lap coming up here before too long, Bob. The 156th lap will be the halfway mark, and Gillette will pay $10,000 to the leader of that lap. And Larry McReynolds, the crew chief for Ricky Rudd, has told him to turn up the wick, try to get up there and challenge Rusty Wallace and take that lead and try to get that $10,000. So there's Wallace right behind uh, Mark Martin in car number six. And let's go to uh, Dr. Jerry Punch, who's uh, with Richard Petty. Jerry? Well, he's behind the wall, still sitting in the STP Pontiac. Richard, what's the problem? <laughs> I don't know. We know they would fix it, but that's what they're trying to do now is find it. Just started smoking. I don't know if it's a valve cover or, or what it is. It just started smoking, kept getting worse, so we had to stop. Well, a lot of smoke out of the STP Pontiac in the seventh time. Winston Cup champion will not win it today. Will not get win number 201. And you see Dale Lemon and the crew beneath this car trying to determine where the oil leak actually is. So they continue to work here as the laps click away. There's Dale there on the uh, left side of your screen as he checks the underside car of that STP Pontiac trying to determine what's causing the oil leak. So Richard Petty sitting in the pit area while the race continues on the track. 146 laps have been completed, and there is the leader, Rusty Wallace. Well, that car has worked very well, even though he has been passed earlier in the race by Ricky Rudd, but he beat Rudd out of the pits this time and has had no problem staying in front of him. Dale Earnhardt, meanwhile, is making another pit stop as he brings the Richard Childress Chevrolet down uh, to... Uh, his particular assigned area. You can see that the interval there is only one second between Rusty Wallace and Ricky Rudd. And Rudd is trying to take over the Trouble lead. Trouble down in turn one. It looks like a blown engine down there. It's a lot of smoke, and the caution is coming out as Dale Earnhardt comes out of the pits. That would have been a scheduled pit stop for Dale Earnhardt, but someone has blown an engine. It's Eddie Bierschwale in car 23 that is going slow down the back stretch, and now we see Rusty Wallace headed for pit road once again, along with Ricky Rudd. And Dick Bergren is down in the Rusty Wallace pits as Rudd moves into the pit area as well. Well, they're ready with right side tires for Rusty Wallace and left side tires as well. They're using sticker tires on him. This end of pit road is only Rusty and the 26 of Rudd going at it. But they both crews now have the right sides of the tires. Car jacked up. Rusty is ahead of Rudd. They've got the right side tires changed on Rusty's car. Rudd's now just starting the left side tires. Rusty with an advantage. They are all watching down pit road while they work. And Rusty's going to beat him. Rusty's going to, oh no. Rudd's advantageous position further down pit road. Even though Rusty's guys finished first, Rudd will enter the racetrack ahead of him. Well, that's an interesting situation there when they're forced to stop by the NASCAR official down there. They were ready to charge back onto the racetrack, but both had to stop. Ricky Rudd did indeed lead Ricky Rusty Wallace out of the pit area as we are under our sixth caution period of the afternoon because of a blown engine on the Eddie Fierschwale car. Back in a moment. Back at Phoenix International Raceway, the Checker 500 from Phoenix International, located about 25 miles to the southwest of uh, downtown Phoenix, Arizona. Rusty Wallace uh, lost the race out of the pit area to Ricky Rudd. Let's try to reach uh, Rusty on the radio here. Rusty, this is Bob Jenkins. You got a copy? Bob, go ahead. Rusty, how are things going? You appear to be uh, in pretty good shape. Is the car working for you well? Everything's just real good. It's just a series of pit stops and everything kind of get everybody out of sync. But yeah, everything's just fine so far. We're just, uh, uh, I can't say anything's wrong. Everything's looking good today. Rusty, uh, this situation of getting out of the pit area ahead of, uh, in this case, Ricky Rudd, is that important at this time or is that something you just don't worry about? It's real, 
reports the problem is when we leave the pit road, the guy with the stop sign runs out and stops us. And uh, uh, it's just a problem, you know, with uh, the line, the judgment line being that close to the number one pit. That does seem to play into my calculations, but we have to overcome it. Rusty, uh, in four more laps, this is lap 152, and in lap 156, uh, the individual who leads that lap will be uh, awarded $10,000 from Gillette. Is that in your mind right now? It wasn't, so you just told me. Now, I'm glad you did that. I didn't know that. <laughs> well, uh, you have your work to do, I guess. I hope we can go back to uh, green before that uh, lap comes around. But we'll continue to watch your progress, and good luck to you. Thank you very much. So that is only uh, less than four laps away now, and I don't know whether we're going to be under green at that time or not. And, Bob, I think the rules are, at least in, in this situation in the past, is that they had to run five green flag laps. If the caution is out during that period, then the, whoever is the leader after five laps. Uh, so we'll confirm that in a moment, but I'm pretty sure that's the situation. So the track crew, crew has apparently completed its job of a cleanup of the oil or other liquid that might have been laid down by the Eddie Bierschwale car. As the field comes off of corner number four once again, we'll get an indication perhaps this time if we'll be going back to green next time. No, we will not. It'll be at least one more lap before we go back to green. So six caution periods have interrupted the flow of things here in this Checker 500 from PIR. Leader is Ricky Rudd, car number 26. Rusty Wallace is second in 27. Third is Mike Alexander in car 12. Fourth is Terry Labonte in number 11. And fifth is the five car driven by Jeff Bodine with 154 laps completed. And we have confirmed there must be five green laps before that $10,000 bonus is paid. Now, let's go to Jerry Punch, who has a report on the driver of this car, the number 17 Tide Machine, Darrell Waldrop. Well, although Darrell Waltrip started in 16th spot, fellas, uh, he has already lost a lap on the racetrack during the green, and the car was slipping and sliding so badly coming off the corners, they opted to come in during this yellow flag and work on the car. They had it on the jack stands here. They got beneath the rear of the car, and they lowered the rear track bar one hole on the right side. Now, by lowering the rear track bar, that will tighten the car up coming off the corners. Waltrip thinks that may be just enough for him to be able to make that lap up, so keep an eye on the car number 17 when we go back to green. That rear track bar is down now, and he should be able to shoot off the corners like a bullet. All right, so we'll watch from that from the uh, number 17 car of Darrell Waltrip. There is the 7 Xerox Ford driven by Alan Kowicki, and he is in sixth position. Alan, it's Bob Jenkins. You read me? I got you loud and clear. Alan, uh, what about the race so far? You're in sixth position. You have led. You're off pit sequence, but how are things going? Well, we're finally caught up now, Bob. Uh, the Zero Jam Co. Ford Thunderbird's running really good. We had a problem on the pit stop earlier where a lug nut got rounded off on the right rear. We got way behind. We've been quite playing catch up ever since, but the car's running excellent. Now I finally got the leaders in sight. Maybe we can make a run at them. Alan, we're at the halfway point of this race, so you've had 156 laps to assess PIR and find out what kind of a racetrack it is. What have you found out about the racetrack? What problems have you found uh, with it and with the race so far? Well, I'd say the biggest problem seems to be a little debris on the track. We've had a couple of flat tires already. That seems to be my biggest concern right now. If we can not have any flats and stay out of trouble, I think we've got an excellent chance. Been a few lap cars that have gotten in the way, but other than that, it's been a pretty good race for us. Where's the best place to pass so far? Uh, it's, it's a little bit narrow here, really, anywhere you can. I seem to be getting guys going in the corners. My car seems to be handling well and staying a little bit lower than them. Uh, everybody's getting a little bit loose here, like I thought. Our chassis seems to be working pretty good, so staying underneath them in the corner seems to be the key. All right, Alan, thank you. We'll let you get back to work. Let's take a look at those drivers and cars that have dropped out of competition in the first half of this race as they begin to line up for the restart in two oppressed formation. Brett Bodine was the first out with a blown motor. Jimmy Bound retired. So does Joe Rutman and Eddie Bierschwale in car number 23. And Bierschwale was, of course, uh, the reason that we are under our sixth caution of the day. Now, Richard Petty was out for quite a while behind the wall, but he now has rejoined the field. Let's go to Jerry Punch in the pits. 
Well, Larry McReynolds, the crew chief for Ricky Rudd, and Larry, a great pit stop puts you out in front of Rusty Wallace, but you had a little extra incentive for this pit stop. Well, that's it. You know, they told us at the driver's meeting about paying $10,000 for the leader of the halfway point, so we've been talking about it for 20 laps, so put a little fire in him, a little fire in us, and we get the lead. Now all we got to do is lead it for five more laps, get that money, and then go on and try to win the race. Should be very interesting. they got to lead five consecutive green flag laps, and Rudd says he's going to do it. He wants that 10 grand. We will watch and see what happens at the drop of the green flag. That's Ricky Rudd there on the outside in the green car number 26. That leads them down for a restart. The green flies. Rusty Wallace is behind Ricky Rudd and then Mike Alexander in third position as they go into turn number one. And of course that quick dry down on the inside of the racetrack as a result of the blown engine but everybody seemed to get through it pretty well. And now Ricky Rudd has opened himself up a pretty good lead over Rusty Wallace. Now Dale Earnhardt is trying to get back on the lead lap once again. Remember, he had just made a pit stop as the yellow flag was coming out, but he did go a lap down. Rusty Wallace did not have a particularly good restart. Uh, Rudd jumped at the start of the, at the uh, drop of the green flag, and Rusty just didn't seem to uh, take off nearly as quickly as uh, Ricky Rudd did. So Rudd is looking good at the moment to pick up that bonus of $10,000. He certainly is, and I think Larry McReynolds uh, hit the nail on the head when he said they built a little fire under Ricky and a little fire in the guys in the pits, got him out first, so now Ricky knows it's up to him to keep that Quaker State Buick out front and try to collect that $10,000. Certainly not being challenged in any way at the moment. He has things solidly in the lead. Here's trouble on the front straightaway. Oh, several cars are into the wall. This is going to virtually block the entire racetrack. Look at the cars all banged up together, several involved. And we have fire breaking out on one of the cars. A lot of fire seen down there as the smoke begins to clear. We are unable to tell you exactly who is involved in this crash, but we do have some fire that's burning on the racetrack. I know Rick Wilson's car was in it. I can see his car was one that was involved in the May Lee here on the front straightaway. The I think fireman over there very quickly to put the fire out as the leaders come around now and just will just about have to stop as they go in there because they can't see where they're going. Yeah, they're going to have to go very, very slowly through this area. I think if they stay to the high side, they're going to get by okay. But boy, just a tremendous crash. The number 31 think, car driven by Johnny Rutherford is involved in this crash. I think he's the one that had the fire. Uh, from it. Now, this is uh, the shot of it from our mountain cam. You can see several cars spinning and hitting the wall. And the car number four of Rick Wilson is out in front. The, the orange car, Michael Walter, I believe, was involved. Rick Wilson has brought his car back around with a lot of damage done to the front end. He's on pit road right now. Richard Petty was at the back of the pack, so he comes in there and just stops. And you can see the fire break out on Johnny Rutherford's car, the Slender U, car number 31. Well, the uh, Rick Wilson car has made his way into the pit area with a lot of damage. There you can see the cars uh, against the inside wall, Michael Waltrip and uh, Johnny Rutherford. And yeah, that's Michael Waltrip's Country Time Lemonade yellow car, number 30, the one that's behind the two cars on this side, the 31 car of Johnny Rutherford. And is that the car number 10 of the, o the car, three zero car three. Okay. Uh, Bill Schmidt, one of the Winston Westa competitor. Let's go to uh, Jerry Punch, who's with Johnny Rutherford. Some scary moments, Johnny. I'm with Johnny Rutherford here. Johnny, first of all, you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I got bumped around a little bit, but uh, you know, I don't know who got out of shape, but all hell broke loose. A lot of fire out there. Of course, you smell the uniform saved you. Some charring on the back of the uniform. Uh, a couple of guys were trying to get out of the car. You were pinned on the inside. They couldn't hardly get to you. Well, I, I knew I could come out on the inside, but I hit my fire extinguisher bottle the third time in my career that I've ever remembered to do that. And uh, it went off, and of course, I had a hood fire on mine, but it uh, really wasn't anything serious. So I just sat there and waited until everybody got by. Thankful Johnny Rutherford, Lone Star JR is okay, and Mike Waltrip has climbed out of his car. They're going to try to get that car back on the racetrack. And up pit road, Dick Bergen standing by with Mark Martin. Dick? Well, Mark, you all right? Yeah, I'm fine. You know, uh, just unfortunate accident with a strobe light Thunderbird. The crew had worked real hard. They had the car handling pretty good. We were looking forward to a top 10 finish. It got run over from behind. It seems like if you try to race through them, they come across in front of you and I run into them. If I try to stop, I get hit from behind. It just hadn't been my hadn't been my uh, my year, you know. Now this this is an unlucky car too. This car has run six times and has crashed out five times. Jerry Punch has more. Jerry? 
The guys had his trouble uh, this year and another bad day, unlucky day for the Kodak Oldsmobile for Rick Wilson. Rick, first of all, you all right? Yeah, I'm fine. Uh, what happened out there? Well, I, you know, I can't really believe, you know, I think Greg Sachs just had a, you know, just lo totally lost what he was thinking about. He hit me on the back straightaway, you know, hit me pretty hard on the back straight. When we come off of uh, uh, four there, I was up underneath him. He just turned into me, spun me around. That caused one heck of a wreck and took a lot of good cars out. I don't know what he was thinking about. Well, an upset Rick Wilson here. He's okay, but uh, you'll have to cool off for a little while. The car heavily damaged. The Kodak Oldsmobile heads back up pit road. Take another look at uh, the crash from uh, our camera outside of corner number four up on the mountain. Well, as Rick Wilson said, apparently he and Greg Sachs got together, and of course they were running in a thick pack of cars, and once they got together and started spinning around, the smoke blinded everybody else, and so cars went spinning everywhere. Michael Waltrip got involved in it. The car 03 of Bill Smith got involved in it, so as Johnny Rutherford said, it really was a rough one. But apparently all drivers are okay, and we'll be back with more of our live coverage after these messages. Stay with us. The cleanup continues at the end of the front straightaway where at least four cars were involved in a fiery crash, but all drivers are okay. Mark Martin involved, so was Bill Schmidt, the 31 of Johnny Rutherford, and the 30 car of Michael Waltrip, along with the four car of Rick Wilson. There is Darrell Waltrip, the driver of car number 17, and earlier in the season, as a matter of fact, after the Bristol race, we uh, followed the... Uh, trials and tribulations of this uh, team led by Jeff Hammond, the number 17 car, the Tide Machine driven by Daryl Waltrip. There was uh, some... After the... for Darrell Waltrip and the Tide team. For 30 weeks out of the year, this team prepares to wage battle against the best of the NASCAR field. But today will not be their day. Trouble early, Jeff Hammond, Penny Jones, Bill Wilburn, and the rest of the crew are forced into action as chisels, torches, and yes, even a hacksaw are used to rework this mangled machine. Even Darrell can't believe how this day has unfolded. This once finely tuned $100,000 machine now resembles a junkyard special. The checkered flag is the only salvation for this tired crew as they lock their troubles up and head home. The day is over, but for tied truck driver Mike Powell, he is entrusted with safely returning home this rig filled with over half a million dollars worth of equipment. Overall, we probably put in probably 80,000, something like that, miles a year going from track to track, taking the cars and all the equipment. Early Monday morning, Powell has arrived at racing headquarters in Charlotte, and yesterday's disaster is unloaded, ready to take its place among these beauties that await their turn. Car in the background is the car we crashed in Bristol on Sunday. This is Monday morning, and we're at the shop. We're in the process of removing the sheet metal, all the damaged goods as far as the uh, fuel cell, remove the engine, cutting the rear frame section away, take it inside the shop, and we're going to reconstruct it, replace all the damaged sheet metal and frame sections, and hopefully have it ready to be used as a backup car in Martin, Virginia in two weeks. The team that eats, sleeps, and works together also finds spare time to relax together. This team's version of recess is called lunch. We're, we're like a family, you know. We see one another probably more than we do our own families a lot of times. And, uh, and we're real close, so we go to lunch a lot, and, you know, we, uh, we have fun together. And we race together, we work together, we, uh, we eat lunch together. We, we have fun together as a whole. Then there are those special rare moments when Winston Cup crew chief Jeff Hammond replaces the thunderous roar of engines with the quiet solitude of his farm and family. The simple things are so important to me. The animals, uh, I, they just, you talk to them and they act like they understand and they're, you know, they're, they show affection and then you got your wife there and you get a chance to talk about things that have gone on around home and you miss a lot when you're on the road. You spend uh, four or five days a week uh, gone, so you, you come home. Come on, a lot there. of things have a tendency to change. Come on, talk. But while Hammond reflects at home, Mike Powell has again crisscrossed the country. And as dawn breaks, he pulls into another Winston Cup arena to begin preparations for what the Tide team hopes will be a winning weekend. 
the ugly duckling of last week is unloaded as a polished swan. Expectation and emotion are again running high. Indeed, the crew, well, they're all smiles, including Darrell Walker, as he envisions glory in victory lane. So as the car is wheeled onto the starting grid, it's another roll of the dice to try and beat the odds once again. And that's the story of a uh, Winston Cup crew and the trials and tribulations that they sustained during the course of a season. Well, let's take a look once again at the crash that has caused this uh, very lengthy delay. And it started when Rick Wilson said he and Greg Sachs got together as they were coming. Actually, Bob, I think they'd gotten off of turn four and down the front straightaway. And as they spun around, then several other cars got involved as well. Rick Wilson, of course, and Greg Sachs, Bill Smith, Michael Waltrip, Johnny Rutherford, and the car number six of Mark Martin. But look now at the crews that come over immediately to the wall and uh, begin to extinguish the flames. Sure, there is a lot of, uh, of competition out there on the racetrack, but when the driver is in trouble, they are right there to assist in any way they can with uh, safety precautions. Well, of course, the safety crew here at the Phoenix International Raceway were on the scene very quickly as well, as well as some of the crew members that were pitted in that area. So the cleanup is continuing from this crash that has taken six cars out of the Checker 500. We'll be back with more of our live coverage from Phoenix International Raceway. ESPN Speed World at Phoenix International Raceway this afternoon for the Checker 500 Winston Cup race. We're in the desert with the cactus and the cowboys and the horses, but that mountain over there back of turn number four is populated this afternoon with thousands of race fans who couldn't get a ticket for a seat, so they have chosen to watch this race from the mountain. Well, two weeks from today on November the 20th, we will be live from Atlanta International Raceway in Georgia for the conclusion of the 1988 Winston Cup season, the Atlanta Journal 500. Airtime is at 12.30 Eastern, and that is undoubtedly going to be the race that will indeed determine the Winston Cup champion for 1988. 12.30, two weeks from today from Atlanta. We're 168 laps into this race, still under caution, still cleaning up this massive crash in the, on the uh, straightaway. No driver injuries involved in that incident. Ned? Well, Bob, let's see if we can raise Rusty Wallace again on the radio. Rusty Wallace, this is Ned Jarrett, the ESPN booth. Do you read me? Ned, go ahead. Well, I'm sure that you're glad that all of that mess was behind you. Yeah, I sure was. I hope everybody's okay. That was kind of scary looking, but... Uh... I don't really know what happened, but I hope everybody's okay. Yeah, the report is that everybody's okay. We noticed on the last restart that Rudd got the jump on you a little bit there and was headed towards that $10,000, but you didn't get five full green laps in, so you'll have to start all over again. You going to be better prepared for him this time? Yeah, I think so. I got it. Uh, I'm hoping that when Earnhardt hits the inside lane and goes for his lap back, he'll get Rudd pushed up high and I'll follow Earnhardt through. I don't know if that'll happen or not. <laughs> see what happens. Okay, we'll see if that works. Good luck to you. Let's go to Dr. Jerry Punch in the pit area with this report. Well, what Rusty didn't tell us, Ned and Bob, is that uh, when Barry Dotson radioed to him a few minutes ago and said, you know, the five, the $10,000 will be after five consecutive green flag laps, but he said that, listen, this is the first time that Rudd and Earnhardt have been running this close together since Wilkesboro, so they warned Rusty, said, you may want the 10 grand, but if they start rubbing up there, just stay back and save the car. We want a championship more than we want $10,000. So Rusty said, we'll do. I'll keep an eye on them, and if the opening's there, I'll get 10000 and the championship. So we'll watch and see what happens. Uh, a lot, No shortage of excitement down here but possibly another shortage up where Dick Bergeron is. Dick? Well, it turns out, Jerry, that the crash wasn't bad for everybody. It sure was for the teams who got knocked out, but it was not a bad thing for the teams who were searching for tires. We had another tire shortage situation going. Uh, many of the teams went running around to the cars involved in the accident even before they got this thing cleaned up. Uh, what's happened now is Earnhardt's team is searching for tires. They'd like more. Elliott's okay. Rudd would like to find a set. Rusty would like to find a set. And Waltrip's team says they are borderline. But there are still some additional tires around here. Hopefully, everybody's going to have enough to be able to get good sets for the run to the checkered flag. So the cleanup still continues from this crash. And so we will take another commercial break and return in just a moment with more of the Checker 500.
171 laps complete out of 312, and Ricky Rudd has a lead over Rusty Wallace, Terry Labonte, Mike Alexander, and Jeff Bodine. Six through ten, Alan Kowicki, Sterling Marlin, Bill Elliott, Davey Allison, and Phil Parsons. And then 11 through 15, Benny Parsons, Bobby Hillen Jr., Harry Gant, Dale Earnhardt, and Kyle Petty. Now we'll check the cars that have been forced out of competition. And most of those that have uh, dropped out have been because of this most recent crash. But before that, outward Brett Bodine, Jimmy Bound, Joe Rutman, and Eddie Bearshwale. Michael Waltrip was involved in this crash, as was Rick Wilson, Mark Martin, Johnny Rutherford, Greg Sachs, and Bill Schmidt. But again, all drivers are okay. Well, Bob, of those 15 cars that we saw there, 13 of them are in the lead lap. Dale Earnhardt in 14th position is a lap down. So is Kyle Petty in 15th position. Dave Marcus is in 16th. Kenny Schrader, 17th. Jim Sauter, 18th. Darrell Waltrip, 19th. Dale Jarrett, 20th. Derek Coop, 21st. The car number 69 of Trevor Boys is in 22nd position. Chad Little is 23rd. From 14th through 23rd, those cars are all one lap down. Neil Bonney is two laps down in 24th position, and Ken Bouchard, also at two laps down, is in 25th position. Still no indication that we're going to go back green. Uh, they are just still trying to uh, get things sorted out after this very lengthy caution period and the... Uh, and the accident now. Uh, Look at Michael Walker's yeah. car coming back out. Boy, I thought he was finished for the day, but Mike Beam, the crew chief on the Country Time Lemonade Pontiac, has, uh, he and the crew have done a lot of work on that car and have gotten him back out there, so he's going to join the fray, even though he's a number of laps down, but those laps have been under caution here since he went out of the race as a result of being involved in that accident. So you can scratch Michael Waltrip off of your out-of-race list because he is just about to rejoin in the Country Time Lemonade Pontiac. Well, we welcome you if you're just joining us for this Sunday afternoon of racing here at Phoenix International Raceway. It's almost 3.30 uh, our time and almost 5.30 on the East Coast. So far today, we have had some exciting racing and a couple of incidents. The first, uh, actually the second caution period of the day was brought about on lap number 24 when the 68 car of Derry Cope spun and then joining him was the number 52 car driven by Jimmy Means. Then we had Dale Earnhardt and Joe Rutman involved in an incident coming off of corner number two. Rutman was able to get going immediately, but Dale Earnhardt lost a lap. And then this massive crash here on the main straightaway that occurred just a few laps ago. There were six cars involved in this and a little bit of fire from the Johnny Rutherford car. However, all drivers got out of their cars and there were no injuries as a result of this very bad crash down at the end of the front straightaway. And that's where we are right now, as the field still is behind the Pontiac pace car. One of those cars that was involved in that accident, Mark Martin, we had a note that uh, he had debated. He had just stopped before that to top off the fuel tank, figuring he could go the rest of the way with one more pit stop. And uh, that proved to be not good strategy as he was back there in the pack and was in that accident. Let's go to Dr. Jerry Punch on Pit Road. Well, we're not exactly on Pit Road anymore, Bob. We've snuck around behind the garage here. We're going to give the fans a peek at what's going to happen in 1989. Now, we've gotten the keys from Junior Johnson. We've unlocked the Budweiser truck back in the, in the infield here. And what we're going to show you, this is the car they've been running all year for the past couple of years. That's the 88 Chevrolet Monte Carlo. But no more Chevrolets in 89. This car on the bottom, the brand new 1989 Ford Thunderbird. This car loaded up here in the truck will go to Atlanta this Thursday for testing. Junior Johnson will debut the brand new Budweiser colors on a Ford for 89. And we'll give you this preview. We're going to lock it back up here very quickly. And I promised Junior I'd get the keys right back to him. A lot of folks would like to be in this truck right now with me looking over this car. But we'll lock it up, fellas. Okay, thanks, Jerry. So that's the car that Junior Johnson will be campaigning along with Terry Labonte in the 1989 Winston Cup season. We'll be back to Phoenix in just a moment. Bob Jenkins, Ned Jarrett, Jerry Punch, and Dick Bergeron back at Phoenix International Raceway where the Checker 500 has now been under caution for 15 laps because of this accident down at the end of the main straightaway. However, it looks as if, yes indeed, Harold Kinder is going to raise his finger indicating one more lap to go. So it has been a lengthy caution, but we're just about to go back to racing. 
Bill Elliott has had uh, his ups and downs throughout the afternoon as Elliott now is uh, back in the top 10. He started the race in sixth position, dropped all the way back to 25th at the end of 40 laps. Then at the end of 80 laps, he had moved up to 19th and now is in eighth at the end of 175. Of course, when he dropped back to the 25th position, he made a pit stop fairly early, Bob, and made an adjustment on his Coors Ford, and, and that put him at the back of the pack, but he was sort of off sequence as far as pit stops were concerned for a long while, and he would get back in the pack and then come back up through, so he's driven a good race, but he has uh, had to do a lot of battling to get back up through the pack. Now, we'll remind the fans again that five green flag laps, there's a $10,000 bonus for the driver who leads after they have run five full laps. And on the restart, it's going to be Dale Earnhardt positioned to the inside of Ricky Rudd for the second time this afternoon. Earnhardt still trying to get his lap back. He is a lap down in 14th position, but will try to get it away from Rudd as they come around for the restart. Rusty Wallace is right behind the leader, Ricky Rudd, and the number 21 car of Kyle Petty is right behind Dale Earnhardt on the inside of the racetrack. Rudd once again gets a tremendous jump coming off of corner number four, and he just pulls away from Dale Earnhardt, so Dale is going to struggle once again to get that lap back. He and Rusty Wallace, meanwhile, are side by side as the cars come out of turn number two. Earnhardt has his nose ahead of Rusty Wallace, and here comes Terry Labonte in car number 11 showing some strength. And he might have uh, his eyes on $10,000. But he's got two cars to pass before he can get to Ricky Rudd. Earnhardt has positioned himself between first and second, Rudd and Rusty Wallace. There's one green lap. Wallace is going to really have to go to catch R Rusty, or rather Ricky Rudd. Rudd showing uh, that that car is running very well at this stage of the race. Yeah, I think uh, Rudd is actually pulling away from Rusty at this point, so if he can keep that kind of pace going, he'll have that $10,000. That's pretty good, nice bonus for the halfway point. Well, it sure is. Uh, we're well past the halfway point, but remember, we were under caution just before the halfway point, and uh, then we had this very lengthy period. So although the race is 178 laps old, we have not yet paid the $10,000 that was supposed to have gone to the individual who led at the halfway mark. Now Terry Labonte challenges Rusty Wallace for second position. Labonte is showing some strength that we haven't seen today. He's been up in the top 10 most of the day, but he can't find a place to move around Rusty Wallace. He looked on the outside. That didn't work. Then tried to look on the inside, but that didn't work either. Terry Labonte in the number 11 Budweiser sponsored Chevrolet and Rusty Wallace in the number 27 Pontiac sponsored by Kodiak. And there they are battling for position out of turn number two through the dog leg. Three green laps have been completed. This will complete four for Ricky Rudd. As you can see, he is stretching out the advantage over Wallace and Labonte. Notice how they're still hugging the inside of the racetrack down between turns one and two. Some of the cars before this lengthy caution had moved up in the groove there, Bob, but these cars now with new tires on them are running very low down on the inside of the racetrack. Okay, here comes the $10,000 for Ricky Rudd, and he is going to win it rather easily. He crosses the stripe, and there it is. Gillette Personal Products Division awards $10,000 to Ricky Rudd. The Quaker State Buick team owned by Kenny Bernstein, the crew chief on the car, Larry McReynolds, all will share in the $10,000 bonus. Ricky has won victory so far this year on the Western Cup circuit. He won the Budweiser at the Glen back in August, has come awfully close in several races recently, but just hasn't been able to put it all together to get the Jericho flag first, but doing a good job here today. And Mike Alexander is coming in for a pit stop and an unfortunate break for Mike who was running in fourth position and having a tremendous afternoon. And this is certainly an unscheduled pit stop. They're going under the hood, it looks like, on the car, so it's not a tire problem. Now they're talking to Mike Alexander to see if they can figure out what it was. So now they do raise the hood of the car 
very unfortunate for a young man that had driven a tremendous race here this afternoon. Watching this battle for second position still with Wallace in 27 and Labonte in number 11. And now watch Jeff Bodine in the yellow and white car number five stick his nose into things and make it a three car battle for second spot. Well, Bodine was the pole setter here this afternoon. He lost the lead fairly early to Rusty Wallace, but he has stayed in contention all afternoon and certainly is not to be counted out in this race. Things have settled down here just a little bit now in this uh, battle for a second. That was a side by side affair a little bit a little while ago, but uh, now Wallace is in second, followed by Labonte and Jeff Bodine. We go inside with the Hardy's race cam once again, the car driven by Dale Jarrett, as he is involved in uh, some traffic. Ahead of him is the number 33 car of Harry Gant. Let's follow him around. Interesting to hear the places that uh, Dale gets off the accelerator and onto the brake and then back on the accelerator as he is right behind the uh, number 83 car driven by Lake Speed and the 33 car driven by Harry Gant. And Richard once again, Petty is getting the black flag once again. Petty had been behind the wall for quite a while with a smoking problem on his STP Pontiac, but uh, now apparently the smoke is coming again and they have black flag Richard Petty. There he is slowing down coming out of turn number two. So Richard will be going to the pit area once again. He has had problems for the last 50 laps or so trying to stay in the race but uh, continues to be black flag. Let's go to Dr. Jerry Punch who can assess the Mike Alexander problem. Well Mike Alexander is still sitting in the pit. It's a tough break for the young driver from Franklin Tennessee. They have an ignition problem. They are changing all the wires all the spark plug wires. They also are changing the rotor button and distributor cap on the Miller Buick and uh, he's been sitting here now about four laps or so so he will lose a lot of time and still sits while they try to diagnose the problem. So Mike Alexander who was running in the top five falls out of it and sits in the pit area while the crew tries to find the problem on that car. Rudd, Wallace, Labonte, Bodine and Kowicki, Marlon, Elliott, Hill and Gannon Allison in the Checker 500. There is something wrong with the Hardy's Oldsmobile car number 29. We are inside that car with Dale Jarrett right now, but we've seen some smoke at the end of that at the uh, tail of that race car in the last few laps, Ned. Yes, and he's dropped off the pace a little bit. He's still running, Bob, but running on the low side of the racetrack, and you can see that there is some smoke coming from the back of the car. Now, on the straightaway, it's not too bad, or I should say when he decelerates to go into the turn, we don't see it, but then there are points on the racetrack where we see smoke coming from it. The NASCAR officials have been looking it over and uh, they have just given him the black flag. So Dale will have to bring it into the pits and see what the problem is. Dale was running in 20th position, but now receives the black flag and will have to come in to get that situation resolved. A lot of smoke coming from it at times on the racetrack. The Hardys Oldsmobile driven by Dale Jarrett. Well, there's a the leader, Ricky Rudd from Chesapeake, Virginia. Ricky came into this race in uh, 11th position in the point standings and as Ned indicated he has won one contest earlier this year on the road course at Watkins Glen but has been very close in several other races he was second in the most recent Winston Cup race at Rockingham and finished seventh at North Wilkesboro and eighth in Charlotte so he has been in the top ten in the past three Winston Cup races here is a battle between the number seven car of Alan Kowicki and the five car of Jeff Bodine and Bodine uh, was up there in a position uh, battling for a second for a while but now Alan Kowicki has come on to take away the uh, fourth spot from Bodine. Kowicki's car has been running very well as he's mentioned when we talked to him on the radio he had gotten behind had made some pit stops early there because of a lug problem but since then the car has really been running good. Well, Ricky Rudd, while we watch uh, Kowicki and Jeff Bodine, Rudd has led 100 of the 194 laps so far. 
and Rusty Wallace has led 66. The driver who leads the most, of course, will receive extra bonus points from uh, Winston. But at the moment, Rudd has led the majority of the lap so far. Rusty just doesn't seem to be able to close in very much on Rudd. No, Rudd has pulled away. You can see Dale Earnhardt in the black car number three, who is a lap down, is still running in front of Rusty Wallace. And Terry Labonte right on the back bumper of Rusty Wallace. But Ricky Rudd has been able to move away from them and uh, just sitting out there running on the racetrack by himself. He's not in any traffic. You can see him on the left side of your screen as he goes into turn three and those other three cars which are running fairly close together. Dale Jarrett goes back out of the pits but still smoke coming from the Hardy's Oldsmobile. I'm sure that they'll be bringing him back in here before too long. Wallace second and Terry Labonte in third position. The leader is Ricky Rudd. Look at the people that have gathered over there on Monument Mountain just off turn number four. Here's Jerry Punch. Every Winston Cup racetrack has its own unique feature that makes it sort of special on the tour. At Martinsville Speedway in Martinsville, Virginia, it's the famous Duck Pond. Well, here at Phoenix International Raceway, it's Monument Mountain. Now, this Monument Mountain here, actually part of the Australia Mountain Chain, separates the Phoenix Raceway property from the Gila Indian Reservation. This fence actually is the boundary line for the Indian Reservation. But today on race day, it serves a special purpose. It is the general admission portion of the grandstand. The reserved seats, all 32,000 of them, had been sold long before this race began. So some 7,000 fans have bought seats at $10 a head for this beautiful panoramic view of Phoenix International Raceway. Seven to 10,000 fans sitting here watching the first ever Winston Cup event to be held here. We arrived at the racetrack about 7.30 this morning. There were hundreds of people lined up to gain a general admission ticket that would allow them to sit on this mountain. And as you can see, there are several thousand this afternoon that have gathered here. Lots of fans from all over the country, not only the Southwest, but lots from the Southeast have gathered here for the Checker 500 at Phoenix International Raceway. We'll be right back. With now 109 laps to go in this 312 lap 500 kilometer race at Phoenix International Raceway, we'll present our field summary and show you the cars that are on the racetrack. The leader of the event is Ricky Rudd in the Quaker State Buick car number 26. Now these cars are in no particular order. These, this certainly isn't a first and second and third situation, but just showing you the cars that are on the track. Also out there is the number 19 car that's driven by Chad Little. And he is uh, several laps off of the pace. As a matter of fact, two off the pace in 21st position. Dale Earnhardt is in car number three. He's in 13th spot and one lap down to the field. Behind him is the second place car of Rusty Wallace, who was one of our five leaders that we have, uh, rather eight leaders that we have had so far in this race. Rusty Wallace in second. In third position is the number 11 Junior Johnson Tim Brewer prepared car driven by Terry Labonte. And Jerry Punch has a comment on Terry from the pit area. Labonte starting back in 17th spot. They're pretty impressed to be up there in the top three or four right now, currently being shown in third. Now this car that Terry is driving here is the car they used to win the Winston with at Charlotte back in May. It's the car that won the All-Star race. It's also the same car they used to finish third with at Rockingham. It's probably the best car they have for the mile or mile and a half tracks, and they will run the same car in Atlanta in two weeks. All right, Labonte is in third, but look at the challenge that he's getting by the number seven car of Alan Kowicki. He's in fourth position. It's been an uphill struggle for Alan, who got off pit sequence, but is uh, running a very strong race in fourth position in car number seven. And it looks like that Alan may challenge uh, Terry here, although Alan has been running behind Terry for the last few laps and has not been able to uh, pass for that position so far. It looks like they're going to fall back into a single file formation. Now, Allen closes in a little bit going into turn number three, but Labonte is successful in holding off Allen Kowicki and maintaining that third position. So we'll continue now with our field summary, and the next car, I believe, is one that we have already talked about, namely uh, Chad Little in car number 19, so we'll go to the one behind him. That's the number 69 car that's being driven by Trevor Boys from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Of course, uh, he used to be a semi-regular on the Winston Cup Series, but 
has uh, not been competing as regularly in the past uh, year or so. The number 24 car is driven by Gary Collins, who has a lot of track time here in the late model competition. And uh, he was involved in one of our early crashes, but is still in the race. And then there's Jeff Bodine in the number five Levi Garrett Chevrolet, who is in fifth position. And the next car that we'll pick up would be the number nine car driven by Bill Elliott. He is in seventh at the moment. The current Winston Cup points leader hoping to nail down his first championship. If he is not able to do so today, then he'll take the battle to Atlanta, and that is where the Winston Cup title will undoubtedly be decided. Now we go back here and check on this race for a position involving the number 33 car driven by Harry Gant, the Skull Bandit Chevrolet, and the Piedmont Airlines Pata, Oldsmobile rather, that's driven by Sterling Marlin, and this is seventh and eighth, and Gant goes into seventh position. And coming up on them is car number eight of Bobby Hillen, who has run a very good race here this afternoon. Hillen is currently in ninth position as Gant, Marlin, and the number eight car of Bobby Hillen Jr. are all battling for position. Sterling Marlin, as we told you, will have Sunoco sponsorship on this car next year. Now Hillen moving to the inside of Marlin, and Bobby Hillen Jr. takes over a position. Marlin, I don't think, is real happy with the way that car has been handling. He's uh, had his hands full practically all afternoon, although he has been able to stay in the top 10. Here's Kyle Petty in car number 21. He's shown in 15th position, a lap down to the field. And the next car in the running order would be Kenny Schrader in the Folger Chevrolet. He, too, is, is one lap down as we see him pass Dale Jarrett, who has just come back into the race after spending about 10 or 12 laps in the garage area. And racing with Ken Schrader is the car number 68, the pure later Ford of Derek Cope. Cope is currently running in the 16th position. That is uh, four position they're running for. Schrader is in 15th and Cope in 16th, so they're battling four position, each of them one lap down. Good side-by-side -side battle in the dogleg. Here comes Derry Cope side-by-side -side with Schrader, and he passes him rather easily on the inside. We'll see what, oh, they bump there. <laughs> Schrader let him know that he wasn't particularly happy with losing that position, but Do Cope does indeed hold on to the 15th spot. And right behind those cars, comes the car number 55, I believe, of Phil Parsons. And behind him is the car number 28 of Davey Allison. And those cars should be racing for position as well. They're running for 10th and 11th. Phil Parsons running 10th and Davey Allison running in 11th, still in the lead lap. So we're finding several battles for position and here is another one. Second, third, and fourth here. Look at Alan Kowicki showing his muscle, battling alongside Rusty Wallace, and I believe that Allen is going to go into second spot. And this is not good news for Rusty Wallace. Every position that he loses, and he's lost two here, just in a matter of feet, every position he loses means fewer valuable Winston Cup points. Well, he just lost 10 points right then. However, you know, that depends on what happens at the end of the race. That doesn't mean... Uh that those points are taken away from him, but two positions when they're running in the top five is 10 points. We have a car that's smoking badly in turn number three after having apparently expired an engine. That's the 89 car driven by Jim Sauter from Nacita, Wisconsin, the Evan Rude uh, Pontiac. Now, Jim, of course, was uh, a very good qualifier starting the race from fifth position, but it looks like that his afternoon is off or over as he pulls behind the wall and Jim Sauter will drop out of competition. Back to the leader, meanwhile, it is Ricky Rudd in car number 26. So we've completed 216 laps, and we're now less than 100 from the end of this inaugural Checker 500 at Phoenix. Back at Phoenix, where Jeff Bodine in car number five is being challenged for fifth position by the number nine car of Bill Elliott. Here comes Elliott on the inside, and there's Harry Gant right behind Elliott. This is a three-car battle for position, and Bill Elliott is going to go into fifth position. That's Jeff Bodine in the number five car high on the racetrack. 
Harry Gantz sneaking below him on the inside as the cars move out of turn number two down the back stretch. Bill Elliott is certainly coming on strong. Yes, he is. He's now back up into the top five once again. Gantt now trying it on the high side. He didn't make the pass on the low side, but looks like he's going to be able to make it on the outside of Jeff Bodine. You can see there's some left rear quarter panel damage to Jeff Bodine's car. Maybe Gantt saw that and said, hey, I don't want to get too close to him. I might cut a tire. So he decided to pass him on the outside where the sheet metal's a little smoother. Very strong race for Harry Gantt so far this afternoon. His uh, year has not been all that impressive, dropping out of several races. However, he did finish the most recent Winston Cup race at Rockingham, where he finished seventh but uh, has been the victim of several mechanical problems and accidents. And here's Rusty Wallace coming into the pits. Rusty Wallace, who had dropped back to fourth, and this should be his last pit stop. Pit stop, pit stop. Right side tires. Is this on schedule, do you think, Ned? No, I, I think this is on schedule. Let's go to Dick Bergman. Well, he's in here. He's taking right side tires, Ned. His guys were just walking up and down pit road with a lot of other teams looking for tires. The tire shortage has materialized. Here is Rusty in 11.6 seconds. He's back out. It was not a scheduled stop. He had a flat right front. The right front was cooked, and that was the problem. Yeah, it looked like that tire was flat when it came yeah. off of there, so it was unscheduled. I thought that it was just a little bit early, maybe about 10 or so laps earlier than uh, what would be a normal pit stop. But now the question is, can he go the rest of the way? We are at lap 223 and uh, certainly within the uh, the window are we not yeah he should be able to go the rest of the way as far as fuel is concerned you're running pretty close but uh, he's getting almost four miles to gallon about three and nine tenth seconds and for more on that let's go to jerry punch well ned you're talking about rusty making it the rest of the way on fuel i just talked to uh, harold elliott a minute ago and they were planning on pitting rusty on lap 233 which would have given him uh, roughly 79 laps to go that would have been his final stop they feel like they shouldn't go more than about 80 or 81 laps because they're real concerned about this car picking up all the fuel in the fuel cell. This is the same car that he ran at Michigan and finished second, but he finished second because he ran out of fuel twice up there with the same car, Whitney. So they don't want to risk it. He may have to make one more stop. Hmm. All right. Well, we'll watch and see what happens. Right now he is a lap down, but has... Uh been able to pass the number 11 car of Terry Labotti. So with those uh, new tires on that car, he is moving well. Yeah, but he's about probably four or five seconds behind the car of Ricky Rudd. Will time him. Rudd goes across the start finish line as Rusty comes off a of turn four. So that's the car that he has to catch and pass before he can get back in the lead lap. And here's Rusty crossing the start finish line eight seconds. So he's got a lot of making up to do before he can get back in the lead lap. Of course, Rudd has one more pit stop to make. No question about that. Now, when it'll come? Well, probably in the next uh, 10, 12, 15 laps. Rusty, by virtue of that pit stop, does go a lap down and in 13th spot. So here's Rudd coming off of corner number four once again. Moving to the inside to pass Chad Little going into turn number one. Also there is the Lifeboy car driven by Dave Marcus. Now, Bob, in the last three races, Rusty Wallace, of course, won them. In each case, he was two laps down rallied to make up those laps, came back and won the race. But he had the fastest car in both of those races. I don't think today that he has the fastest car. He has a very fast race car, but I think Ricky Rudd has the fastest car. He's proven that. He's led more laps than anyone else. So it might be a little bit tougher. Even if he gets some cautions, it might be a little tougher for him to make up even the one lap. For those of you just joining us, it is just about 6 o'clock on the East Coast. It's 4 o'clock here in Phoenix. We are live at Phoenix International Raceway for the inaugural Checker 500 Winston Cup race. And we are 228 laps into this 312-lap event. And here are the top five. Ricky Rudd, the leader. Alan Kowicki is second. Terry Labonte is third. Bill Elliott fourth. And Harry Gant is in fifth position. Six through ten, Bobby Hillen Jr., Jeff Bodine, Davey Allison, Sterling Marlin, and Phil Parsons. You'll notice that Rusty Wallace is not in the top ten. Again, he just pitted a few laps ago, his apparently final pit stop of the afternoon, although there is some discussion about that. Nevertheless, he is a lap down in 13th position, but should be able to get that lap back when everybody else comes in for their stop, should we remain under green. Well, we're watching Ricky Rudd. His car seems to be handling very well here right now. We do have a report that Alan Kowicki says the tires are beginning to go away a little bit on his car. Alan running in uh, second position right now, but still running very well on the racetrack. Let's go to Jerry Punch once again. Well, well, the strategy here in the Quaker State pit is this, gentlemen. 
He is planning on pitting on lap 234. That is exactly four laps from now. Now, that would give them 78 laps to go to the completion of the race should it go green, and they could make it the rest of the way. They are hoping it will go green. They feel very comfortable. They want to get a good, quick pit stop. Larry McReynolds said the big Q better stand for quick today because we want a good stop with no mistakes, and we will get this race in the book as our win. So lapping and pitting here in three laps now will be Ricky Rudd. Well, Jerry, while you were talking, Kenny Schrader passed him. The fans saw that on the screen. Now, that doesn't mean that Ricky Rudd had slowed down. Ken Schrader had just made a pit stop and had new tires on the outside, and that enabled him to move around the leader, Ricky Rudd. And so we'll watch for Rudd to come in in the next couple of laps. So, indeed, it does show that the new tires can... Uh, give you some faster speeds but it also shows that Rudd is on the older tires and therefore needs some new ones if he's going to stay up. We'll be right back. Ricky Rudd leads the Checker 500 here at Phoenix International Raceway. He is well actually he's gone over now the uh, prescribed lap that he was going to come in on. He was supposed to come in on lap number 34 according to his crew. He has completed lap 235. And coming down this time, he will complete lap 236 if he does, or is he going to make the pit stop? Nope, he's staying out there again. Yes, he is. He's uh, riding pretty comfortable, I guess, and hates to give up that lead. And he knows that when he and uh, Rusty or Alan Kowicki stops, that that'll put Rusty Wallace back in the lead lap. Well, he is expected in at any moment, just trying to get as many laps out of those tires and out of the fuel as he possibly can. Rudd has led the majority of laps here this afternoon and looked very strong all race long in that Quaker State Buick. Okay, here he comes. He's coming down pit road this time, which should be his last pit stop of the afternoon. And Larry McReynolds and the crew ready for him. And they want to make this a quick one. Jerry Punch is there. Well, Ricky Rudd had radioed to the crew exactly what you said, fellas. He said, let's stay out a couple more laps. Maybe we'll get a yellow flag. We can keep some of these guys a lap down. But it didn't happen, so they are now in some 75 laps from the conclusion of the Checker 500. Two right side tires, two complete cans of fuel, 13.610 seconds, and they were quick. They said they would be, and they were. That is a very good pit stop, and that should give them enough fuel to go the rest of the way. Dale Earnhardt had just made a pit stop as well, which should be his last pit stop. Earnhardt, of course, running a lap down as a result of a spin earlier in the race. So with uh, Rudd relinquishing the lead now, it goes to the number seven car driven by Alan Kowicki. And look who's right behind him. That's uh, Rusty Wallace, who is again a lap down at this point because of his early pit stop. But he has newer tires than does Alan Kowicki in car number seven, so he'd like to move in front of him in case a caution should come out. Of course, Kowicki will have a pit stop coming up before too long, but Rusty Wallace driving his heart out once again as they go around the Piedmont Airlines car of Sterling Marlin, car number 44. That car is still kicking up a little bit in the turns, moving high, which allows Kowicki and now the car number 27 of Rusty Wallace to move by, and Bill Elliott is coming into the pits, and we understand that Alan Kowicki will be coming in in about four laps. There is uh, Bill Elliott, who has stopped the Coors Motorcraft Ford in his stall, and the Elliott crew going to work on it. Jerry Punch can explain what's going on. Well, Ernie and Dan Elliott and the rest of the Motorcraft Coors Melling crew here changed right side tires. 13.7 seconds. I tell you, these guys are doing an excellent job in the pits. Elliott down and away. Moving out on the acceleration lane and rejoining the racetrack out in corner number two, the number eight car driven by Bobby Hillen Jr. is also in for a pit stop, and Hillen is running in the top ten. As a matter of fact, he's in the top five, relinquishing that fifth position when he came in for what should be his final pit stop of the day. And he, like everyone else, is taking on right side tires. Those are the ones that give up first because they get most of the strain when they go into the turn. Good pit stop for him. Benny Parsons was just in. We saw Sterling Marlin coming into the pits. Kyle Petty is in as well. So everybody making these last pit stops as we see Bobby Hillen go back out of the racetrack. He'll enter the racetrack coming off on turn two. And the number seven crew, the Kowicki crew, begins to ready itself for a possible stop by the leader of the race in a few more laps. Remember, Allen is off sequence with everybody else because of a uh, unscheduled stop very early in the race, but the Xerox team is looking for him within the next few laps. There he is on the racetrack leading the Checker 500, Allen Kowicki. 
Well, Kowicki had a bad qualifying lap on Friday, the first day of qualifying here, but came back and was the fastest second round on the second day of qualifying. And here, is he coming into the pits? No, well, he no, not out. this time, staying out. They told yeah. him the pit, we understand, but he stayed out there. There's the battered car of Rick Wilson, the number four machine. That was one of those involved in this massive six car accident at the end of the straightaway that caused a yellow flag of about 15 laps. Nobody injured in that crash, but it certainly was a very scary looking accident as we had some fire and uh, some very badly damaged race cars as a result of it. Kowicki still stays out there on the track and does not come in for a stop. Well, I think his crew is expecting him in. Now, whether they have radio communication, I don't know. Or if Alan says, well, let's let me run here as long as I can. Of course, sometimes it doesn't pay to run too long and run out of gas because there's a lot of things can happen if you run out of gas. You can burn a piston. You can have to coast back into the pits yeah. <laughs> and uh, have trouble getting it fired. Just a lot of different things that can go wrong. But Alan apparently feeling pretty comfortable with it. He stays out there one more time. No banking on the turns here, so you can't really use the banking to get uh, to coast back into the pit area. So Kowicki is staying out there and stretching it just as far as he possibly can. We understand, however, he should be coming in this lap. We'll wait and see. He's in the dog leg now, setting the car into turn number three. He'll be getting on the brakes right here if he is coming in, diving to the inside, yep. and nope. <laughs> He's fooled us again. There's Jeff Bodine, who has come in, and Bodine, one of those also running in the top five, comes in for what should be his final pit stop of the afternoon. And Davey Allison is in the pits a little farther up pit road for what should be his last pit stop. He's getting right side tires as well. As Bodine goes out, Jimmy Means goes out uh, after making a pit stop in the Eureka vacuum cleaner car. A little bit of body damage there on the left rear of the number five Levi Garrett Chevrolet. And Kowicki Alan just, Kowicki just, yeah, he just is surfing. not uh, really paying attention to the crew if they are <laughs> indeed calling him in. But I would imagine that Allen is pretty much calling the shots here. Well, he owns his own car and uh, certainly is in position to call the shots. And he, when Rusty Wallace came up on him there a little bit ago, Bob, that looked like Rusty might get back in the lead lap, but Allen was able to pull away from him, and so he hasn't been threatened with that here recently. So he figures, well, heck, I'm running some pretty good lap times, so why don't I just stay out here and run for a little while? But yeah, staying out. I thought he was coming in that time. He dipped <laughs> down to the inside of the racetrack, but uh, still staying out there, circling around. That completes lap number 248 for Allen. It's a 312 lap race. You can see the shadows now over the uh, first and second turns as the sun begins to lower itself in the western sky. So while we wait for the Allen Kowicki pit stop, which apparently is not going to come in the next couple of laps, we'll take another break and be right back at the Checker 500. While we were away, Alan Kowicki did finally make his pit stop. It was a routine one, but it did give up the lead to Ricky Rudd in car number 26. Also, Actually, Bobby, it gave up the lead to right. Terry Labonte in car number 11, but he only ran a couple of laps, and then he came in for his pit stop, so that does put Ricky Rudd back in the lead. And second now in the serial scoring is Phil Parsons. Third is Alan Kowicki. Fourth is Terry Labonte. Fifth is Rusty Wallace. And sixth is Bill Elliott. Seventh is Bobby Hillen Jr. And in eighth position is Harry Gantz. So we're set up now for the end of the race. As everybody should have enough fuel to go the distance. These cars are here for the very first time. After a few laps, we ask Rudd, does this track remind you of any other that you have ever run on? Well, I'm trying to think. You know, turns one and two compare maybe a little bit to to say Pocono turns three and four to me compare more to turn nine at Riverside more than than any track that we run so it's the corners are so much different than anything we run on a typical standard oval track that uh, it's altogether different driving style it takes to get around here more like you would use for getting around a road course. So Rudd compares it with uh, several tracks and even compares it to a road course and certainly he uh, is a fan of road courses because his only win in the 1988 season has come on the road course at Watkins Glen. Now the second place car uh, driven by uh, Phil Parsons has not made his final pit stop so he will undoubtedly drop out of that second position when he does come in. Alan Kowicki went 98 miles before he came in the pits as we look at Phil Parsons. 
passing the 19 car of Chad Little. Parsons in car number 55. And Terry Labonte went 100 miles on a tank of fuel. That was a little more than most of them expected to get on this racetrack. Now, on the higher bank tracks where they turn the track in about 25 seconds, then they can get sometimes 100 miles on a tank of fuel. Here's Darrell Walter Finn for what should be his final pit stop, and he's gotten some good gas mileage, too. He's perhaps went over 100 miles. Tied Chevrolet driven by Darrell Waltrip. And you can see that they're putting some tape at the top of the uh, windshield there on the driver's side. And that's simply yep. because they're staring right into that sun as they come down the straightaway. Yeah, it, it gets blinding when you go into turn one here late in the evening. And NASCAR competition director Dick Beatty told them in the driver's meeting this morning that they would be permitted late in the race to put it on the outside of the windshield. Normally, they have to put it on the inside, but they told them here today, you will be able to put it on the outside, and they just did on Darrell Waltrip's car. And they certainly need it because the sun is uh, lowering in the western sky, and they're looking right into it as they go down the straightaway, just as they do at Rockingham. The lead held by Ricky Rudd. There is the top five with 255 laps completed. Top five in the Checker 500, Ricky Rudd, the leader in second position. Was Phil Parsons, was and now Phil he's Parsons. coming into the pits for what should be his last pit stop. He had relinquished second position to Alan Kowicki, but now with Parsons in the pits, he's going to fall out of the lead uh, lap. Phil Parsons in for his final pit stop. As they go to work on the right side of that car, the fuel going in the left rear. Tires are on. Cars full of fuel. There goes Phil Parsons out. Neil Bonnet had positioned himself just ahead of Phil, also making a pit stop. And as we see Phil going back out onto the racetrack, Neil Bonnet also gets that car rolling, although it's very slowly down pit lane, and he too will go back into the race. I feel a little bit slow getting up to speed back there, but it takes takes a little while now he gets it to going again now Rusty Wallace has moved back into the top five as a result of all of these pit stops we're not sure though if he'll be able to go the rest of the way how about it Dick Berger well they're not sure either Ned to tell you the truth I asked engine builder Harold Elliott if they could go all the way and Harold put his fingers together like it's going to be very very close then I snuck a peek at the computer the computer says uh-uh they're going to come up short by about six laps hmm. so will they roll the dice and try it we'll have to stand by and see the national championship could hang in the balance if Rusty runs out of fuel and can't make it back to his pit that could be the end of their hopes if it works it could be a good thing for him Jerry what do you think well, they are concerned up here in the Kodiak pits, and they are pitting right beside the Z-Rex pits of Alan Kowicki, and they are very, very happy here in the Z-Rex pits. And the reason, not only is Alan running well, but, you know, all the pit stops they had early in the race, all the trouble they had with the cut right front tire and the lug nut problems, and they are now running second in the field. A panel of experts at every Winston Cup race will pick a mechanic of the race, an outstanding performance by a crew chief, and they have picked Paul Andrews, 31-year-old crew chief for Alan Kowicki, as the TRW mechanic of the race race his first time ever to win that and I tell you it's great because they only have about three or four full-time employees and Alan Kowicki's got to be awfully proud of this young man an honor well deserved on the Kowicki team right now Ricky Rudd is running about eight seconds ahead of Alan Kowicki who is running in second position and Bob for the last five or so laps that hasn't changed too much now Rusty Wallace is running fourth and Bill Elliott is running fifth. So we undoubtedly, if they continue to be the way they are right now, will not have a decision on who's the Winston Cup champion this year. 45 more laps to go in the Checker 500 here at Phoenix International Raceway. And what's been a tremendous weekend of activity here at the uh, racetrack with thousands of people turning out for this race. We had a good crowd on hand yesterday for the Southwest Tour race that we'll have uh, later this week here on ESPN, a race that was won by Jim Thurkettle. The race here this afternoon being led by Ricky Rudd. Second is Alan Kowicki. Third is Terry Labonte. Fourth is Bill Elliott. And in fifth, rather a fourth is Rusty Wallace, and Bill Elliott is in fifth spot. Ricky Rudd looking for his second win of the 1988 season. This was his 322nd career start. And as far as career wins are concerned, he has won nine Winston Cup events. 
Moving to the inside and passing the number 52 car driven by Jimmy Means. And from our mountain cam outside of turn number four, we have a panorama overall view of this one mile D shaped oval here at Phoenix as Rudd goes into turn number three. He's still maintaining about a seven and nine tenths second lead over Alan Kowicki, who is running in the second position. We'll check him again this time as he goes across the start finish line and Kowicki coming off of turn four. Kowicki has been in some traffic recently. He's coming up on Darrell Waltrip now and he's still about seven and eight tenths second behind uh, Ricky Rudd. Rick Wilson was involved in this crash down on the main straightaway. However, it did not stop him from uh, competing in this race. He took the front end off the car, but he's still out there on the racetrack picking up some Winston Cup points. Dick. Bob, that wins my vote as the most bashed up car to return to Winston Cup racing in 1988. The whole front end of that thing was torn out from the crash. The radiator was way back into the engine. The fan was gone. Front end components were gone. These guys have done an incredible job getting this car back onto the racetrack. You can see a little piece of pipe on the front. That's what used to be the front bumper. That's all pushed in. Almost everything from the firewall forward is crooked twisted but he's out here running at well over 100 miles an hour it's a tribute to both the crew and Wilson this is the never give up we never quit attitude we've seen in Winston Cup racing in 1988 and it's very very refreshing well Dick there's a group of drivers back there that are battling to stay in the top 20 in the Winston Cup point standings 20th place in New York on December the 2nd will pay $20,000 in point money Rick Wilson Michael Waltrip Dale Jarrett Dave Marcus and Richard Petty are all trying to get in that top 20 they were separated by just a very few points or, or less than 100 coming into this race so that's why they put this car back together to get out and make as many laps as he possibly can Dale Jarrett's already out of the race Richard Petty's already out of the race Michael Waltrip has had trouble so there he's just trying to gain as many points as he can now certainly he's not running at full speed he's running at a pretty good clip out there though and uh, he's driving it at a pace that I would say is certainly is safe as far as he and the other competitors are concerned we got a shot of Michael Waltrip's car a little while ago and his isn't looking real great either but it certainly is in better shape than the Rick Wilson car. Now we see the number five car that has been lapped so there are eight machines now on the lead lap as the uh, number five car of Jeff Bodine was running ninth but now goes a lap down. The next car that will go a lap down the one running in eighth position is the 28 car driven by Davey Allison. So Ricky Rudd just continues to put the competition away here in the Kenny Bernstein Quaker State Buick. I had a feeling Bob that he'd run good on this racetrack. Well I did too. He was my second choice as winner before this race started. I thought maybe that Rusty Wallace had the strongest car but uh, that has not proved true and my second choice to win this race was Ricky Rudd and we're certainly not over yet but Rudd has uh, led the most laps this afternoon and I think has proven that he has been the strongest throughout most of the first 275 laps. Excitement, speed, Phoenix and NASCAR, we're here for the Checker 500. Back at Phoenix where Ricky Rudd continues to set the pace and again we remind you that toward the end of the race in just a few more laps as a matter of fact we'll be announcing the Goodyear Eagle driver of the race and Goodyear will be giving $1,000 to the Winston Cup Racing Wives Association in that driver's name. Bill Elliott is in fifth position while Rusty Wallace is in fourth spot. So if the race were to end right now, the way they stand, Rusty Wallace would gain 10 points on Bill Elliott in the battle for the Winston Cup because Rusty has picked up five points for leading a lap today, whereas Bill Elliott has not led. And he would also get five uh, points for uh, finishing one position ahead of Bill Elliott and so Rusty would pick up 10 points and they would be separated by 69 as they go into the final event of the year at Atlanta in two weeks time. Well Bill Elliott again has been a model of consistency here today Bob. He's running in the top five in fifth position at the moment and we mentioned at the top of the show that he has in the last 15 races has finished in the top 10. In fact, I think we go way back into 1987 since he's had a mechanical problem that has put him out of a race. He did have a crash in the first race at Atlanta back in March of this year, but he has not fallen out of a race since the race at Pocono last year with mechanical problems. So he's uh, just driven very nicely and smoothly here today. 
kept the car in contention, now running in the fifth position. Harry well, Gant running in six, not too far behind him. You can see Gant coming into the picture back there. Well, Jerry Punch is down in the pit area to talk with Ernie Elliott. Well, gentlemen, well, gentlemen, you said it was a long time ago. In fact, it was at Pocono last year, so they had their last mechanical failure. And I'm with Ernie Elliott. And Ernie, again, you guys are a model of consistency. You've been consistently running well throughout the year. And here today, a good, strong top five right now. If the race were to finish right now, you would only lose 10 points. How's the car running? How does Bill feel? Well, you know, right now, he's just trying uh, to hang on. And the car's been a little bit loose all day, and we just not got to adjust to him. And we lost that a lot of time early because of a cut tire and we've just never been able to make it up. Ernie Elliott here directed the effort to the poor smelling team. They had that early pit stop and they got back in traffic and they almost got lapped. They were within two seconds of being lapped by then leader Rusty Wallace. So that, that's when they escaped that one. And here they are just running in the top five, trying to finish the second 500. If they do go to Atlanta, separated by 69 points, it's going to take a, a very strong finishing position by Rusty and a very poor finishing position by uh, Bill Elliott in order for Rusty to win the Winston Cup. Yeah, the statisticians will figure that out, but you're right. It would, it would be uh, a lot of positions that would have to be made up by Rusty Wallace, and Bill Elliott would simply have to have trouble for that to happen. So it appears as if we will go to the final race of the year in Atlanta before we will decide who wins the Winston Cup in 1988. Well, Ricky Rudd continues to lead as we watch Bill Elliott continue to circle the track and we put the clock on him again. Here's Alan Kowicki crossing the finish line. Now he's gained some. The last time we clocked him, he was about seven and eight tenths seconds behind. Now he's only six and six tenths seconds behind. So Alan Kowicki has picked up about two seconds on Ricky Rudd. Second position is Kowicki, third Labonte, fourth is Wallace, and fifth is Bill Elliott. And we are 285, make that 286 laps that have now been completed. In the sixth position is Harry Gant in the Skull Bandit car, and in seventh is Davey Allison. Now those are the only seven cars on the lead lap. Ricky Rudd is, is about 100 yards behind Davey Allison from putting him a lap down, but Allison has been able to maintain that position or that distance between here and Rudd for the last 10 or 15 laps. So we see Rudd, Kowicki, Labonte, Wallace, and Elliott running in the top five, and Gant, Allison, Hillen, Bodine, and Parsons in the second five. We are back at Phoenix and in the closing laps of this 300-kilometer race. And for those of you who tuned in to see the Barber Stop race from Del Mar, California, unfortunately, we will not be able to present that at this time while we finish up this race and prepare for NFL primetime. We understand that there may be an overheating problem developing on the Quaker State Buick car number 26, driven by Rudd, who leads this race. Now, that's what we hear. And uh, he's only got uh, 21 more laps to go before the end, so that remains to be seen. However, we have made our determination, and in our opinion, the Goodyear Eagle driver of the race is Alan Kowicki. Goodyear will be sending a check for $1,000 in Alan's name to the Grand, or rather the Winston Cup Racing Wives Association, from a very good driver to a very good cause. Alan is running second in the race, and he has come back from. Uh, a couple of adversities this afternoon to run very strong in the race, and that's the reason why we have chosen him as our driver of the race. And he is now gaining on Ricky Rudd. He has cut what was an eight-second lead down to about five and six-tenths seconds, Bob. So this race is not over, even though Ricky Rudd is sitting out there comfortably ahead. But if he does have an overheating problem, maybe he's backed off a little bit to sort of conserve that engine. Let us uh, update the fans. We, we talked about what what. Well, we see maybe some smoke from this car. Dick Bergeron, have you got a handle on what might be happening here? I sure do, Bob, and you are dead right. He does have an overheating problem. Ricky Rudd is having problems with that engine running hot. The faces on the crew here are faces of concern. Everybody is worried. This team has dropped out of nine races this year with engine failure. They are right now getting the equipment ready to spray water on the radiator in case Rudd has to come in definite overheating problem in Rudd's car. The time is running out. Can he hang on or is this going to be Alan Kowicki's first win? 19 more laps to go and the smoke becomes more evident from the Ricky Rudd car on every circuit of the racetrack. This completes lap 294. 
and the race is 312 laps so it is not over don't go away stay with us now look at the smoke coming out of that car it's very evident now and the lead has shrunk to four seconds so he's lost half of the lead that he did have. He was eight seconds ahead, now it's four, and I suspect it'll be less than that the next time around. Now let's go back and pick up what you were about to talk about, Ned, and this uh, Winston Cup situation. Okay, if Rusty Wallace should win at Atlanta, if they wind up the way they're running here today, which is in uh, fourth, Wallace is in fourth place, and. Elliott in fifth place and to go to Atlanta with the 69 point lead Bill Elliott would only have to finish 18th or better even if Rusty Wallace wins the race down there our statistician Ken Martin has figured that out for us and it would also mean the elimination of Dale Earnhardt from a possible uh, Winston Cup championship. Yeah, the way things stand here today, the way they're running on the racetrack at this point with not too many laps left, Dale Earnhardt has been elim eliminated as far as any chance of winning the championship this year. He is running in 12th position at the moment, and he certainly uh, received a major setback when he had that incident with Joe Rutman early in the race in which the two spun off of corner number two, and Earnhardt lost a lap at that time, and is just been uh, a very disappointing race for him since that time. Ricky Rudd is trying to stay on the lead and there is the sentiment of the Alan Kowicki crew as they are hoping that he and Rudd is slowing down. This is it. Rudd is slowing down. He's coming into the pits. Obviously something has gone wrong with that car. As we indicated overheating may be the problem in any case. Here comes Ricky Rudd into the pits with 16 laps to go and let's go to Dick Bergeron. No, he's not. They are ready the for him. They're ready with the water hose. But he's not, not coming going to have to use it. He's turned back into the garage. His day is over. Unbelievable situation again for Ricky Rudd, who once again comes close but does not win the race. And now Alan Kowicki is set up for his first ever Winston Cup Series win. Well, Allen has run a very, very strong race here today, starting in the 21st position, dropped all the way back at the tail end of the pack early in the race when he had some tire problems, cut a couple of tires down, then they had a lug nut problem, got all of that squared away, and has driven his heart out and now leading the race. So Allen Kowicki could be in victory lane for the first time in his Winston Cup career. We have had 13 different winners in uh, the Winston Cup competition in 1988, tying the record that was set in 1986. If Allen should take the checkered flag this afternoon, we would break that record, meaning there have been 14 different winners on the series this year. Allen Kowicki from Greenfield, Wisconsin. This was his 85th Winston Cup start. His best finish has been a second on two different occasions, including one this year at Darlington. He now has a 14 second lead over Terry Labadi, who is running in second position. So he has an even bigger lead than Ricky Rudd had on Kowicki before Rudd started having his problems. And there are 13 more laps to go. 299 are complete. So he could lose a second a lap and still win the race. What a story this is going to be and what a celebration this is going to be for Alan Kowicki. He has just uh, performed so well on so many occasions this year but something has happened to the car or something has gone wrong that has prevented him from uh, tasting the sweet taste of victory but it could happen now in 12 more laps for Alan Kowicki. So as we get set up for the finish and as the Alan Kowicki crew prays for his victory we'll be back right after this. I'm in the garage area with a disappointed Ricky Rudd. Ricky, what happened? Did the motor give up finally? Well, I think it must have cracked a cell on ahead or something this time. It started running hot with about 60, 70 laps to go. And for the longest time, I just was nursing it. You know, I got out front, got a big lead, and the water temperature started going crazy. So I just backed off the throttle. Must have run another 50, 60 laps just running partial throttle and surprised that uh, it was able to make it as long as it did. Well, it was a good, strong run, but today victory lane will not be for Ricky Rudd. Well, the state Buick's been awful tough this year. You know, it, yeah, it's disappointing. You know, it's hard not to be, but we're coming back next year. We got Lula Rosa coming on board, and uh, we feel like we got a good shot at the championship. He sure does. You can believe that. Six more laps to go for Alan Kowicki and his first Winston Cup win. Let's go to Jerry Punch quickly in the pit area. 
gentlemen, in 1977, Alan Kowicki graduated from the University of Wisconsin with a mechanical engineering degree. He told me he couldn't believe that nine years later, he was the Winston Cup Rookie of the Year, 1986. And here, 11 years later, from his graduation from college, he is an accomplished Winston Cup winner. Alan Kowicki's crew tensely waiting with his laps count down. They can't believe it either. We have a couple of more stories developing on the racetrack, however, as we watch Alan Kowicki headed for victory lane. The second position is held by Labonte, but here is the battle for fifth place. Davey Allison in car number 28. Make that the battle for fourth. Davey Allison in car number 28 is challenging Bill Elliott in number nine, and Davey Allison sneaks into fourth position. We'll watch Elliott battle back, though, on the outside in turn number three, but it looks like that Davey Allison has completed the pass, and yes, indeed, Allison is now in fourth. And that'll take five more points away from uh, Bill Elliott, so that could reduce it down to 64 after this race, if it stays the way it is right now with Rusty Wallace running in the third position. And running in ninth position and looking for his best finish of the 1988 season is a guy who qualified rather well and has been very consistent, Benny Parsons. And here comes Rusty Wallace in for a pit stop. This is uh, quite a development here. Yeah, we but they were concerned about the fuel, and Jerry, apparently they didn't have enough to go the rest of the way. So they know they just no, they didn't, man. They just came down pit road just a minute ago. And Rusty said the fuel pressure gauge fluctuated. He had to come in. They were going to try to roll the dice, and they came up short. He had a six-second pit stop for a dash of fuel. Okay, so now that scrambles the point situation a little bit uh, different. That'll probably put Rusty Wallace behind Bill Elliott. We'll see what, how they stack up on the racetrack as the leader, Alan Kowicki, almost bumps into Rusty Wallace, about to put him a lap down. So uh, I believe that Wallace there is in sixth position because he is the last car on the lead lap. There were six cars on the lead lap. Rusty is still on the lead lap, but now in sixth spot. So yes, he is uh, one behind Bill Elliott with two laps to go. And we, we wanted to mention about Benny Parsons' best finish of the 1988 season. He is running in ninth position, and there he is. Nice performance this afternoon by Benny Parsons. But all of the eyes here at Phoenix International Raceway are on the leader, Alan Kowicki. Here he comes off of corner number four, and Harold Kinder has the white flag in hand. There it is displayed to Alan Kowicki, who'll probably take no chances and may just let Rusty Wallace stay right there. He'll take no chances of becoming involved in any kind of an incident as he is on his last lap now with about a half mile to go before his first Winston Cup victory ever and it comes at Phoenix International Raceway in the inaugural event here. Alan Kowicki from Greenfield, Wisconsin in his 85th start on the Winston Cup Series. Here he comes out of corner number four. Rusty Wallace a little bit loose coming off here. They're going to cross the line just about side by side, but it is Alan Kowicki winning the inaugural Checker 500 from Phoenix International Raceway. And what a drive he has made here this afternoon. As they were crossing the start-finish line, Harry Gant apparently ran out of gas. Let's try to contact Alan on the radio. Alan, you with us? Yeah, I did for my radio. Congratulations, you did it. Yeah, thank you. It's great. I'm so happy I could just try to. The guys and the crew worked hard all year for this. We had our problems early, but we came back. And I'd like to thank my sponsors, Derek Pamico and Winter Ford. Say hi to my dad who's been coming to all my races. He finally missed one, and it happened to be there one I won. But I hope there'll be more. Alan, we'll talk to you further in Victory Lane. Just wanted to get your early uh, congratulations in here on a very, very fine afternoon for you. And more, thank you. So we'll talk with Alan Kowicki in Victory Lane in just a moment. He's won the Checker 500 here at Phoenix. The Checker 500 at Phoenix International Raceway has been brought to you by Goodyear Eagle Tires. Goodyear, because there really is a difference. By Purolator, the first name in filters for Pure Oil now and Pure Oil later, it's Purolator. By Quaker State Motor Oil, the big Q stands for quality, always has, always will. Alan Kowicki got lost on his way to victory lane. He isn't there yet. He took a lap 
going the opposite direction on the racetrack. But now he's down here in front of us and they'll be pushing his car into victory lane in uh, just a few moments. Quite a sight. There is Alan uh, going down the backstretch the wrong way on the track. Bob, I have been involved in the sport of auto racing for about 35 years. And that's the first <laughs> time that I've ever seen the winner say out on the racetrack and go the wrong way. But he wanted all of those fans. He wanted to wave at them. The thousands up on the hills here at the Phoenix International Raceway and everywhere. He wanted to see him. He took an extra lap while you yep. were talking to him on the radio. Right. And he has been a long time getting to Victor Lane, but boy, he is really a happy fellow. Just wanted to savor the victory, I guess. Well, our Winner's Circle interview is being brought to you by Goodyear Eagle Tires. Goodyear, because there really is a difference. And we see Dr. Jerry Punch right there. Jerry, take it away. Well, outstanding, Alan Kowicki in the Z-Rex Ford, and he rode to victory on those Goodyear Eagles you just mentioned. And, Alan, all I can say is special K. Congratulations, partner. Oh, it was a great day for us. Uh, and the Goodyear tires did work good for us all day. We had a couple of flats, but we came back, and the, the crew did a good job. And Paul Anderson and Randy Andrews, uh, Bob Sutton, all the guys on the crew really deserve a lot of credit. Uh, that victory lap there is something I had thought about for a long time, and I wanted to do something special and never be another first win, and I just wanted to give them something to remember me by. <laughs> Hello. We were talking about that. The extra lap while you're talking to Bob Jenkins. You know, outstanding effort. 85th start for, for Alan Kowicki. Special K. Now entry into the Winston next year. The All Star race. He climbs out to a celebration. 33 years old. Special K has a special day at Phoenix. Gentlemen. Well, it's nice to see Allen in victory lane at last. He was one of those who uh, you just thought that was going to win a race uh, soon, and by golly, it finally occurred under a deep blue sky here in the Arizona desert, about 25 miles outside of Phoenix, Arizona. The uh, points now, Bill Elliott with 43.58, Rusty Wallace with 42.79, and Dale Earnhardt with 41.27. Earnhardt is eliminated from the Winston Cup, and uh, there were no points gained by Rusty Wallace. He went into the race 79, and he comes out 79 behind. So Elliott needs to finish in the top 18 to clinch the title at Atlanta in two weeks' time. My thanks to Jerry Punch and Dick Bergeron on pit road and to Ned Jarrett in the booth. Don't forget Speed Week this Thursday night at 7.30 Eastern Time. We'll see you two weeks from today for the final event at Atlanta International Raceway. Till then, Bob Jenkins, so long, everyone.